Uh, you're gonna get your. Is it is it still donkey and chains you're talking about this week? No. No donkey in chains. I didn't say that enough yesterday, so I'm just going to say it a couple of times here as you guys get your education on with the professor in a day. Peace. A very upbeat introduction. Yeah, song. I was like dancing, yeah, like, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, like the school bell ringing. <laughs> right? <laughs> like, having a good time over her. What is up, beautiful people? Welcome to Learn How to Trade, formerly known as the Midday Show. That is your girl, Adara. I am Sharif, and we're going to wait for some people to migrate over because we are on our own stream now, and we got to wait for everybody to come from the Big Boy Morning Show. Here they are. There Shout we go. We got Darwin. Darwin in the chat. Also, theme of the day, thirst trap. <laughs> oh, my God. Tina Man killing me today. Sailor Moon, Dad Trader, what is up, everybody? Big Michael Lloyd, Roger, Renata, uh, Joshua Walker, everybody coming in there, babe. Big Bob Dub, SD, Mary W. Bisky, and then Dam. I like that. Sailor Moon, it's she is a one yeah. named Sailor Moon. I love that song, man. I can't get it out of my head. All right, guys, um, before we get to the topics, today we're going to talk about. Two very good ones. Volume weighted average price. Almost everybody and their mother's fourth cousin uses that. Is there such thing as fourth cousin? Um, I think there could be. There could I'm be. I'm not really, right? no. We got into this whole discussion in, uh, uh, before we went live one day. Remember we were talking oh, about yeah. this? Oh, yeah. With, um, with, didn't this come up with the whole Lisa... Uh, Sue and Jensen. It was, okay. yes, I thought yes. It did, yeah. That's where we got into it, Jensen Huang and Lisa Sue. Uh, and then we're also going to talk about fibs, Fibonacci's. How to use them, what strategies uh, you can use them. There's not just one way, kind of like when we talked about RSI and um, the uh, MACD, different ways that you can utilize these bad boys, not just one, um, one off way. But before we get into all that, I really want to get into this futures look right now because... I can't tell you how many times I've been talking about wicking candles into critical resistance and support levels. Case in dang point. Look at this over here. We make that big move up on the opening print today on the NQ. We get into that 16.2 level. Look how we trade at 16.2. Wicks above the level, all the closes south of 16.2, showing you that sellers are overwhelming buyers in that particular area. And then look what happens. We quadunk right after that. In the same way that we were wicking above 16.2 and rejecting, we wicked below 16.1 and then reclaimed it. Same look. So 100 point level. I'm involved in the future right now. It'll show up in a second. I'm not sure why it's not showing up. Um, you took a trade there. Uh, in any event, um, we're, I'm looking for that touch at VWAP. It looks like it came like within uh, about a couple of points there at uh, 16137. It looks like we came into that 16133 or so. I'm, I was talking to Dara off camera before we went live. I said, first level that I'll be looking to see if we can clear. And as a, you know, my anticipated resistance level, how apropos VWAP, right? That's the big white line here on my chart. So anytime you see a white line on my chart, it is the volume weighted average price. Doesn't matter what chart we're looking at. I try to keep it uh, nice and uh, nice and simple there. So we're looking for a 16-1 hold and a possible continuation, but the first level, the hurdle that I'll be looking to clear here on the way up is that 16-137 or so, that general area, which is a VWAP on my chart. How was your morning? My morning has been pleasant. Um, lots of, you know, it was at the big desk, got to see, I, it was really cool actually too, being at the big desk, seeing like a crazy morning like this morning where things kept kind of running up. Mm. Um, I really appreciated the experience. I feel like every time there's like a big, lots of stuff is happening in the market, I always really enjoy right. kind of getting to see everything for the first time. Like same, my first IPO was really exciting too. But yeah, lots of movement in the market, fun to watch. As we can tell, I have dipped my baby toe into a Eli Lilly short right now. And I can explain why. Okay. Um, lower high, lower high. Um, we're down on the day. Hmm. Um, I do not honestly like see this one having much upward momentum given this giant swoop to the downside and the fact that we are kind of uh, teetering off off of this um, five, 588.50. Uh, I am only part filled uh, currently, so we'll see how this continues to go. But we do have some of our shares in that basket right now. If we have a decisive break upwards of 588.50, I will be out. Why? Because it will be a new high. But in the meantime, um, I think like this one earlier, we got to like 585. So I think that would be incredibly pleasant. Um, 
yeah, so I am, I am looking forward to this. Um, I'm not looking, we'll see how it goes. Um, I do not mind this trade as of right now. I would, we'll see if we get fully filled, but yeah, there we are. Sounds good. All right, guys, we are brought to you by Search Trader, account funding of up to $1 million, keep up to 90% of the profits, enjoy relaxed trading rules with an 8% max trailing drawdown on all new accounts. Shout out to the folks there at Search Trader, who I think still have that uh, trading competition, so make sure to check those guys out. All right, guys, we let's start with our first topic on the day. We didn't make uh, any secret about this. VWAP, volume weighted average price. What the heck is it? <laughs> the Katina man likes that one. And uh, what do we use it for? Uh, let's talk a little bit about what is volume weighted average price first and foremost. I know it's something that I use every day, but sometimes I forget really what the hell is behind it. The volume weighted average price is a measurement that shows the average price of a security or an instrument, don't get at me crypto people, okay, adjusted for its volume. It's calculated during a specific trading session by taking the total dollar value of trading in an instrument and dividing it by the volume of trades. Simple, total dollar value of trading in an instrument and dividing it by the volume of the trades. The formula for calculating VWAP is a cumulative one, basically price X volume divided by the cumulative volume. We got that. Why is it important though? Like what are we using it for? Why does everybody and their mother's third cousin talk about it? VWAP gives traders a smoothed out indication of an instrument's price, adjusted for volume of course, hence the name, uh, over a, a certain period of time. Personally, my VWAP starts every morning at 4 a.m. I'm not talking about anchored VWAP here where you can start VWAP at your area of choice. Shout out to Brian Shannon. Like Michael Moss talks about this all the time um, when he's on at uh, on 845 Mondays and Fridays. He says, you know, from earnings, from key troughs, from key crests, we'll talk about um, anchored VWAP at a later date. We're going to talk just basically about normal VWAP uh, today. It is used by institutional traders to ensure that their trades do not move the price of a security that they are trying to buy or sell too extremely. So for example, uh, say, you know, they're, they're trying, uh, you know, GM, case in point today, probably some big money positioning coming into GM given what they're going to do with the buybacks and et cetera and all the other news items today. So say, for example, a uh, hedge fund wanted to position themselves into it. Well, if the, if the price uh, is above VWAP, they may not want to punch in at that particular moment because they'll look at it as artificially inflating the price and squeezing it up too much, possibly causing a squeeze and not allowing them to get in at a better price. So the, what they'll do as they'll wait for the price to dip below the volume weighted average price and then they'll scoop up some there, okay? Again, Michael Noss explained this to me when he was here because he, he dabbled in the hedge fund game for a little while and there are traders, hedge fund traders that are you know, trading in day in, day out, trying to position, um, trying to get you know, securities for what the buying committee has ordered them to get. They're judged about how well they have done with respect to securing good prices for the instruments that they've been instructed to buy based upon what their price is relative to that VWAP. So it's an important thing to keep in mind, especially because big money uses it. If big money is using it, we wanna know about it, okay? Because they they're the ones that move markets. No disrespect to retail traders, myself included, we don't move markets, okay? So um, just anything before I continue? Um, yeah, no, I think it, I think it's definitely an interesting level to keep an eye on. And I think you're right. Like, I think it's one of those ones we talk about all the time, but we mm. don't really like necessarily cognitively think about like, yeah. what does it actually kind of mean for the market? So I know, I think it is, it's interesting to think about. And it's one of the ones that I first kind of looked into because when I first started here, I was like, what's this VWAP that everyone's right. talking about, right? But I think it's also interesting too, and we'll probably get into this uh, throughout the day as well, that it's not always relevant for every stock. And I oh. think sometimes we probably, you know, overhype it a little bit too. So I think it is definitely something to keep an eye on in every trade, but it's not going to necessarily factor in to every trade. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I'll get into this a little bit later. We've been talking about how you should look and see how the particular indicator and the instrument that you're trading are jiving. If they're not jiving, if there's no respect by the instrument that you're looking at at the particular indicator that you want to use, don't use it. Don't use it because it's obviously not being shown any respect whether or not there's a reason for that. It's not for you to find out why. It's for you to react 
to the actual price action, okay? Uh, before I continue here, uh, the future is coming back down below 16.1. My out is gonna be in the low 70s, so I'm gonna give up a little bit of points. We already have three beak wetters here. We got some out nicely in the mid 30s, but it looks like it's gonna come back down. Unless we get a nice decisive hold here on the future, it might be a VWAP rejection and a new low coming in. We know, oh, here we go. This is probably gonna be the end of my trade right here as we come in, and there we go. I get stopped out for a little bit on. <coughs> bless you. Oh, bless you. <laughs> Can you say that when someone coughs? I just say, I feel like I always just assume everything. Like I used to say like bless you when people were like luck. yawning or something. I don't know. <laughs> I just feel like I really want people to feel blessed. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So the market is making new lows. It's not the overnight low that we've been talking about, but uh, we did break through that key uh, level earlier. So I am out for the time being. We'll have to see if we can bamboozle another trade. Am I still positive or am I negative? No, I'm positive. Good. Okay, cool. Um, all right. So here we go. Let's talk about, um, oh yes, I want to give an example for why volume weighted average price is important. For example, a hedge fund might refrain, this is the example I was giving actually, a hedge fund might refrain from submitting, submitting a buy order for a price above a security's VWAP in order to af avoid artificially inflating the price of that security. Likewise, it may avoid or submitting uh, a short below, so in the exact same way. All right, how is VWAP used? VWAP is used in different ways by traders. Traders may use VWAP as a trend confirmation tool and build trading rules around it. For instance, they may consider stocks with prices below VWAP as undervalued, depending on where you've anchored your VWAP, and those with prices above it as overvalued, kind of in the way that we use relative strength index, right? Um, the simple way to use the RSI is to look for a print above 70 and say, oh, it's overbought, or a print below 30 and say, oh, it's oversold. It's obviously not that simple. That's not how I use RSI, but that's you know the textbook definition, the run-of-the-mill definition, okay? If prices, if prices below VWAP move above it, traders may go long on the stock. If prices below, uh, price above VWAP move below it, they may sell their positions and or initiate short positions, okay? Institutional buyers, including mutual funds, use VWAP to help move into or out of stocks with as small of a market impact as possible. That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to uh, lessen the impact uh, that is uh, being you know, put into the market by them so that they don't artificially move the stock one way or another because this may not be what they want. They may want you know, calm uh, positioning into a security, kind of fly under the radar a little bit so they don't tip off any of, the, of their competitors, okay? Therefore, when they can, institutions will try to buy below VWAP or sell above it. This, this way, their actions push the price back towards the average instead of away from it. Okay, go ahead. Anything to add? Yeah, no, I just think it's, um, no, it's, it's interesting really to think about how, yeah, it, it serves as like a good institutional kind of um, buy or sell metric, uh, which I was not really something I realized. Absolutely, yeah. Honestly, with VWAP, because I, I feel like I just think of it as like, you know, kind of on the charts, but it's interesting to think about, I guess, if you're having longer term accounts too, Absolutely. how VWAP would play a role like in that, the longer scheme of how it's performing. Because I think on daily, it's easy to be like, oh, it's near VWAP, but it matters less because, you know, VWAP may move intraday. But no, it is, it's, yeah, it's interesting to think about it on a wider, longer okay. scale. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. And um, one, of the, uh, one of the things that, about VWAP, um, personally, I use it all the time, okay? It's one of those ones that's always on my chart. All right. It doesn't matter what chart I'm looking at. There's always VWAP on there some way, somehow. And I talked about this over the past couple of days and even into last week. It becomes almost a, a group fulfilling prophecy because so many people are looking at VWAP. It ends up being, well, it may be relevant, sure, because hedge funds use it. And I, I completely get that point. But from the perspective of retail traders, it may become relevant because so many other retail traders are looking at it. So if it's a key resistance level and everyone starts selling around there, it may not be, be they're selling for, at that level for fundamental reasons, but rather technical ones, specifically VWAP, and it ends up moving down. So it becomes a group fulfilling prophecy at times. It's hard to know when that's actually happening, obviously, because we don't have an insight in behind the scenes. All right, the limitations of VWAP. 
VWAP is a single day indicator, save and accept for the anchored VWAP. And again, when I'm talking about VWAP today, we are not talking about the anchored VWAP. Look at VVOS, man. This thing is absolutely pumping to the high side here, Adara. 315%. We're about to hit $19. I don't know anything about this stock and I don't know anywhere the resistance levels are, but I think people are probably in a print factory over here. Anybody who took that five, $5 long off the bell is in, uh, you know, they're, they're doing real well here. And there's uh, interactions here between VVOS and VWAP as a level of support. We'll get into that later, okay? So it's a single day indicator and it restarts at the open of each new trading day. Attempting to create an average VWAP over many days could distort it and result in an incorrect indicator. And I guess it's taking a little bit of a shot there at uh, the anchored VWAP because the anchored VWAP by definition, especially if you're charting on the daily, uh, is a multi-day uh, tool. While some institutions may prefer to buy when the price of a security is below the VWAP or sell it when above, VWAP is not the only factor to consider. In strong uptrends, for example, the price may contribute may continue to move higher for many days without dropping below the VWAP at all or only occasionally. Therefore, waiting for the price to fall below VWAP could mean a missed opportunity if prices are rising quickly. And that's kind of like the whole thing with trading here. I mean, if you're looking for a specific level to come into play and that level doesn't trigger, well, then you're leaving money on the table and the opportunity is lost. No difference here. Okay. VWAP is based on historical values and does not inherently have predictive qualities or calculations. Like we talked about yesterday, many of the indicators that we use are lagging indicators. They don't predict the future movement or they're not, they're not trying to predict future movements. What they're trying to give you is historical moves and then, you know, history rhymes. It may not necessarily repeat exactly. Yeah, right? that's interesting. Yeah, it's kind of like using um, historical movement to gauge where you're going to be um, kind of in a trade and to use... Um, levels, which I think is yeah probably the case for like a lot of um, generally how we have like patterns and stuff, right? Like right. if we think a thing will work historically, we can kind of try and see if that works, and that's not always necessarily going to be the case, but they can kind of help uh, gauge what price action might be. So even um, for example, I did get yep. over that Eli Lilly trade because I was kind of noticing what I was worried was a bull flag or a bull pennant, perhaps because we did have that, and then we were kind of topping and trying mm. to run this area. I kind of got worried about the potential flag there. Okay. And I don't know if that was correct. No, we, need, um, we need to talk about that. Let's talk about it. All right, the bull flag. What kind of a uh, pattern is it? It is more bullish. That was why. No, I was no, 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 no. Oh. It can be a bull. It can be a bull flag or a bear flag. The flag itself. What kind of a, a pattern is it? Is it a continuation pattern or a reversal pattern? It's usually a continuation. Okay, which beauty. is why I know we were down on the day, so then I wasn't really sure. So it, sh it should be a bear flag, because yeah. look what precedes it. That is true, like a, a move to the downside mm. and we're down on the day. But I see what you're saying. I see what yeah. you're going for there. And I don't mean to put you on the no, spot. No, I understand. Because I think that we, if, if we're encountering this issue, there's probably a lot of viewers who are, yeah. are thinking the same thing as you. No, I appreciate right? I appreciate that. And yeah, I think, um, yeah, I kind of got out too because we broke that 589 and I was like, but no, you're right. Like, I think sometimes, yeah, it's interesting. Like, we were having this conversation yeah. last week, too. Not everything that seems like a pattern necessarily is Absolutely. a pattern. Absolutely. So I may have been a skosh too hasty there. But yeah, no, I think in general, like, it's interesting to think about how we can use, even if it's not necessarily always, like, for example, with VWAP, going to factor yes. into every trade or matter necessarily every time. You're right. It's, like, good to have these historical levels. Yeah, I know. I agree. Yeah. 100%. Uh, we just broke 19, guys, on VVOS. So it is rocketing now to the high side. 19 and a third is the HOD 20 incoming, question mark. Let's look at the daily chart quickly here. I just got to digress a, a second from VWAP and figure out, look at this day over here. Very interesting day. This is August 8th, 8-8. Eight, eight. Okay, shout out to all my Asians because that's a, that's a good number for them. Eight, eight. Yeah. yeah, look at this over here. We are at exactly 1951. That is exactly the high that we made on August 8th. The high, in fact, was 1944. So we've actually broke it. 1951, that general area. So a possible resistance area here going back to August 8th on VVOS. Uh, let's see if we get continuation. It looks like an absolute rocket ship at the moment, but we need to be cognizant of possible resistance levels. And the first one we need to be cognizant of is this one over here, August 8th, 1944. Uh, uh, high that day. All right, let's continue. So VWAP is based on historical values and does not inherently have predictive qualities or calculations. Made that point. It's also, VWAP is also anchored from the opening price range of the day. Therefore, 
the indicator increases its leg as the day goes on. So on my platform, VWAP starts at 4 a.m., okay? You, you heard the Katina man talk about this it, this morning. He His charts start populating at 7 a.m., and because he's a big tech trader, he, and, you know, seldom does he trade small caps. He isn't really interested all that much in what the price was doing from four to seven. He cares more about what the price w of, the, of the equity was doing between, you know, that seven to 9.30 uh, time slot. And um, for and Neil chimed in, and I think absolutely correctly, he's like, unless you are trading small caps, because some of these small caps, they really get going 4 a.m., 5 a.m., 6 a.m. They don't really... You know, they don't really wait for the bell, a lot of them. And you know, to be honest with you, the last few months, the best time to trade these small caps has been in the pre-market. That's not a hard and fast rule, just a quick observation that I've made. So the point here is the leg on VWAP continues to increase uh, exponentially as the day goes on. The, the least amount of leg is in the early part of the day and the most amount of leg is in the late, latest part of the day. This can be seen in the way a one minute period VWAP calculation after 330 minutes, the length of a typical trading session. I didn't actually know that. Will often resemble a 390 minute moving average at the end of the trading day. That actually makes pure that's sense. That's a cool way of looking yeah. at VWAP, yeah. Yeah, so per, that's all, you know, like the, I don't wanna call it mumbo jumbo, but uh, it is more like the technical side of VWAP. Now, hmm. personally, the way that I use VWAP, here's how I do it. First of all, I look to see, is there any respect by the instrument that I'm, I'm looking to trade and view up on that particular day? And that may not be readily apparent from the get-go. You're going to actually have to let the price action develop to see what the relationship is between the volume-weighted average price and the price action of that instrument. So you may not be able to see that right away. Once you do see it and if, if there is respect, then you start planning around VWAP. Whether it's you want to get in, you want to get out, um, what have you, okay? It, like, I, I, I want to give an example. I just don't have one in the wild. I'm sure one will come up at the, in a second. Actually, I do have one in the wild over here, and it's the NASDAQ. Yeah. We clearly... Yeah, this was a thing Yeah, we, we clearly held uh, that 16.1, and then we made a, an attempt to retrace, and look, lo and behold, where we got rejected, VWAP. So... To me here, uh, it was important to see uh, this kind of develop. Now I know that VWAP was a resistance level that I need to be concerned of if we really kind of reclaim that 16.1 later part of the day, all right? Here, though, you could see on that move down, there was absolutely no respect. No. No. So it's, you know, it's going to be one of those things where you're going to have to, you're going to have to be, you know, careful exactly how you're using it. By the way, on the future, we are now... Coming into yesterday's closing price, 16.048, around that 16.050, that was the yesterday's closing print. And you know how I feel about closing prints. So here we are. We're almost flat, essentially, on the NASDAQ. Do we find some support at the close yesterday? We're getting a couple of wicks off this 16.050 level. Let's see how we develop in and around here, or we're going to continue to trend down. Right? We definitely didn't hold that 16.1 after you know, a nice tug of war between buyers and sellers. And then we obviously broke down. The next level of possible support is yesterday's closing print, and we are there right now. It looks like we're finding some support at the moment. We'll see how this plays out. Anything to add, Adair, or any yeah, questions? Um, yeah, I think it's interesting, too, um, how, like, VWAP will sometimes respect levels earlier in the day and then not necessarily later. Like, uh, the relationship with VWAP and using VWAP as an area of support or resistance for your potential trade can definitely change throughout the day. So I'm actually going to use the example of the short that I am in, which I have semi-mixed feelings about, Stressla. Um, so, uh, and I'll explain why I got it in a second, but first I want to talk about VWAP with relationship to Tesla. Because earlier today, Tesla was hugging VWAP, it was fitting VWAP like a glove, all in the pre-market. Then even earlier, once the day was open, Tesla was really strictly adhering to VWAP, as we can see here, right? It was dancing very much in these levels. Then um, around 10.30ish, we took a sharp swoop below VWAP, Whoop. and then it stopped respecting VWAP, and that's when we also started to see other indicators, to me, of a potential short in play. Lower high, lower high, lower high, Love lower it. low, lower low. That is why I decided to get short. Nice. Um, you know what I mean? And we've still been mostly respecting this 247 level, uh, which is where I entered the trade. So I'm good with it right now. If I see like a strong like 247.50, 
248 area, that, and we kind of break that area, that would, would be where I get out of the short. Because as you can kind of see here, like we do have some, it'll kind of go up a little bit and then fly to the downside. I want to give myself some room for this trade. But yeah, generally it looks like Tesla has lost a lot of its steam to the upside. And I think that's also interesting with how it kind of stopped respecting VWAP. That was when we started seeing those trends to the downside. So that's why I do think it's um, interesting looking with um, yeah. at how a stock interacts with VWAP and how that the changing of that relationship can signify uh, a difference in how the stock is moving. Absolutely. Yeah, very good point. Um, the other point that I wanted to make is I use VWAP a little bit differently um, with big caps as yes. opposed to small caps. Yeah. So not only uh, is VWAP more important for small caps um, because it populates, I don't want to say it's more important, that's not accurate, but uh, I, I use VWAP possibly in the pre-market with small caps because, you know, sometimes they have more volume in the pre than they have uh, afterwards, or sometimes they have more price action in the pre-market than they do after the bell. So it's important that way. But the, the other rule that I have is never to take a small cap gapper long below VWAP. Uh, I will take, though, some of these uh, big cap names long below VWAP. Then the reason for that is I actually respect price levels a little bit more than I do VWAP on these big cappers. Closing prints, lows of day, uh, you know, some a very clear uh, support level on the daily chart for uh, some of these Meg 7 or just big cap names in general, right? Whereas, you know, if we're below VWAP, on a particular small cap gapper, just because it's yesterday's closing print would not entice me to get it long on uh, that on that name unless it, you know, was north of VWAP. So, um, you know, how I use uh, VWAP a little bit differently um, than uh, you know, it depends on really the the instrument that I'm trading. Uh, quickly, I want to mention VVOS. Let me put in the ticker over here because everybody's excited about VVOS, and I think uh, GameStop started moving uh, started moving as, as well. So VVOS, um, you know, not really surprised, rejected off that August 8th level, which was 1944. 1951 is the high. It made a big move down, broke into about 17 and a quarter, so about $2.25 rejection right there. But it's making attempts now to come back above that 19 level. What we're going to look for here on VVOS is the making of a newer high. Uh, this is kind of those ones, if it's not making newer highs, then, you, you know, it may be running out of steam a little bit here. So we're going to have to wait. It's rejecting off 19, and down it goes again into 17 and a third. So for now, that August 8th level on VVOS holding as a critical area of resistance. Now, with respect to actually using VWAP in the wild, I had on my side chart here Zscaler from yesterday. Oh. Zscaler had a hell of a day yesterday even though you know the earnings were a bit of a mixed bag you can see the earnings algo spike here pops up then it's quadunks all the way back down the next day it I mean, doesn't really gap up but incrementally makes its way up so we have two days in a row now uh positive for zscaler but now look what zscaler just did it had a big move up from that buck 94 that it closed out at yesterday got up all the way into 208 found resistance at 208 and then we had a v-shaped recovery back down into you guessed it lo and behold VWAP, 203.35, finding some support now, coming back into that 204 area. Let's see if VWAP here is going to be one of those one, one of the, sorry, VWAP is going to be one of the indicators that's respected by Zscaler on the day. And this would make sense to me if it does, because it's an after the earnings move. We know that big money is likely going to position in the days subsequent to the earnings, right? As the decisions are made uh, by the hedge funds, sovereign wealth funds, you name it, you know, pension funds, whatever. They make, they go through their decision making process about what they want to buy subsequent to earnings. And again, like I finished explaining, they don't really want to get in far higher above VWAP. Number one, they don't want to artificially inflate the price and tip their hand. Number two, the traders that are buying these names for the big money uh, players don't want to have buy, um, you know, they don't want their average price to be far above VWAP. So they're li literally waiting, likely, until it comes into VWAP to hit an ad on um, to their positions. So beautiful hold right now on VWAP, on Zscaler. Look at this, uh, perfect hold for now. 
for now. It's not enticing me enough to get into the trade, but a nice example here in the wild. Oh, Adera. that's nice. Yeah, I mean, like we're always looking for examples here in the wild. So if anyone sees anything interesting with VWAP in the wild, please let us know um, because I really like also the opportunity to kind of analyze these moves, especially as I am still training. But yeah, no, it's interesting, especially as you're saying with like small caps, how um, a, a stock's position above or below VWAP can really impact how it's doing and, and be a sign of, of strength or weakness on the day. And again, example, Tesla, after we failed VWAP decisively, we really fell off here. Um, I did get uh, a dollar out of the majority of my shares on this short. I got half out, um, I guess like half and half. Yeah, so I got half out, was a dollar trade. Very happy. Um, I got out because I was kind of noticing generally these moves were like a dollar, two dollar. And I have a general, like a problem with holding on to my winners. <laughs> um, so I decided, you know better. what, when we had that uh, 240, where did we get out? 246? Yeah, I got out 246 with everything. So that was a dollar winner. Got half my shares out at that 246.50 area because I was noticing some resistance. Um, but yeah, it looks like it's it very much still in play. Um, this one pretty rangy, but yeah, I just wanted to address that. How that 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 broke, break of VWAP was kind of part of what was intriguing me about this name, right? So whether a stock is above or below VWAP and what it's doing um, in relation to VWAP is always, I think, of note. You're right, especially if you're thinking about like what institutional investors are doing too on the wider, on the wider scale. Yeah. Adam demands that I spin the money for you, Adara, here thank because you. you were a dollar in the winner on that TSLA thank you, trade. And thank you, Adam. Yeah, shout out to you. Good, great, great trade there, Adara. Oh, where are you short? I oh, you was got, short. You already got out. Yeah, I always, nice. I do. Very yeah, nice. I like to, I like to be in and out. I could have held on to it a little better. bit longer, but yeah. not gonna complain. All right, guys, GameStop. I keep seeing people in the chat here talking about GameStop. Yes, we are at that critical $16 resistance level. How many times today have we rejected off 16 on GME? It's worth noting that we are at this level. Here we go. So this is the 8 a.m. algo spike. Don't, uh, don't worry too much about that. Look at this over here. 8.30 comes in, 16 reject. Then we have the opening range print. Obviously, we got it to 1641, but look where the closing print is, far south of that. And then 950, 955, 10, and 1005, all 16 rejections. We're right back at the $16 level again. And lo and behold, it looks like we're rejecting again, coming back down to 15 and three quarters. Let's see how we do here. A bit of a higher low. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, I'm talking about GameStop. The Katina man is pumped about GameStop. He's long there. Anybody, where, where are you in long? He, the Katina man is long 15 flat on GME. So anybody following the Katina man's trades, uh, be made aware there. But yeah, that 16 level, I'd like to see a decisive break of that 16 level. Then maybe we can squeeze uh, nicely. He's also short PLTR. I, didn't, I don't even know where the chart is. Hold up. Oh, it'll be like a guessing game. I want to guess, actually, go, go. If, you, if I may. Adair is going to guess where Sean is short, PLTR. Okay. Is it in the 2025 area? <laughs> you just wait for top wick. There you go. Am I right? Yeah, you are. Yay. Okay. Those Thank you nice for the opportunity to, to, to figure that out. Um, but yeah, so that's a beautiful short. Yes, absolutely. Uh, shout out to Nimit. Nimit says, Sean, GME is a great trade for you today. Thanks, man. There you go. You got some love in the chat there, Katina man, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Nimit man uh, in the chat. Yeah, the Nimit man. <laughs> I know I need to come up with something better than that. I just told Adara today, she hasn't been anointed no, with a nickname, right? Well, you know, we got to let this happen organically, though, right? Like, uh, you know, I, I've... I've fooled around with a couple of names. Uh, I wasn't pleased with any of them. So we're gonna, we're gonna have to wait and see what we get for Adara. Maybe if you guys have some good su suggestions in the chat, throw them in there, man. Uh, yeah, Michael, I'm not in a position at the moment. Adara is out of her position as well. I gotta teach, so I'm focusing in yeah, on that. The Tesla was very wild. I just wanted to take my profits and run, but I have my eye on other stuff for sure. Monty says, I dare ya. It's a Get pun it? no, I've heard I don't, before, but I, I'm not. Yeah? You've yeah, heard I, that before? Yeah, I've heard it before. Oh, yeah? Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah. Miss A, no, I can't do Miss A. Emerson, come on, man. We're going to need something more creative than that. Yeah, we're, we're going to have to figure out a nickname for Adair, but one coming soon, no question about I like, it. I like the update on that. <laughs> Steven Romero, much respect, Sharif. Takes a lot to trading while thousands watching. Thank you, thank you, my man. Uh, I love doing it, uh, to be quite honest with you. It's, it's a lot of fun. 
right? And we get to t chat with people in the, in, uh, online and we get to kind of riff back and forth with uh, Adara and I. So, and even we got the Katina man and the Neil next to me too, which, uh, which we include obviously in, uh, in the riffing. Um, uh, what's her name? Uh, Ram Ram <laughs> has chimed in on uh, the Adara nickname uh, discussion. <laughs> she wants Dory. How do you feel about Dory? I don't. I don't really have any opinions on it either way, honestly. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna have it's, to go it's like, like, you know, it's cute. It's like the, the movie's cute. I don't really, yeah, I don't know. All right, well, let's go on. Uh, guys, any questions about VWAP before we move on to Fibs? I know people love Fibonacci's. Put your question in the chat, tag Adara or I, uh, so that we can, uh, we can see uh, the, uh, the question. Otherwise, we'll literally have to read everyone. Adorable Adara. That's nice. Adora the Explorer. Adora the Explorer says these. You guys are hilarious. The Daredevil. I love it. I love it. Keep bringing them. Doc A. Nemo. No. Come on. <laughs> love it. All right, guys. Tag us in the chat um, with respect uh, to VWAP. Any questions about VWAP, though, before we go on to the next topic? I think, honestly, I think... Um Basically, honestly, this is, you know, since I've kind of been on the midday, I feel like I've learned yeah. a lot about VWAP in regards to, I think one of the biggest things I had, this isn't really, I guess, a question, more kind of an observation and just um, something cool that I think I've learned from, from cool. you and our conversations is I think earlier on, like I was saying, I feel like I thought that VWAP always had to be a level. Right. Now, I think I'm kind of realizing that it really depends on, on the stock and on how that stock is interacting at that moment. And I think it also comes back to a conversation that we were having yesterday with regards to um, basically like play, like keeping an eye on, on levels or patterns mm. or indicators, but not necessarily like relying on them every single time because they might not always be relevant. That being said, I will probably have VWAP questions okay. as the day unfolds. Fair. Uh, yeah. We have the first one. D-Loaf, shout out to my man D-Loaf. Talking anchored VWAP, he says, I like it on the daily. Yet when I get to the lower time frame, the value gets distorted. Interesting. Uh, would you recommend not going lower than a 15 minute chart for the anchored? I gotta tell you the truth, D. Uh, I have never used anchored VWAP because I don't have it as um, an option on my platform. I know that it's been added to the Trade Ideas platform and I should probably get on that, but I've never actually used anchored VWAP. The only time that I've really utilized it is when Michael Moss kind of shows it on his analysis in, uh, in his morning uh, prep there. Uh, he has the obviously the tools to, to anchor it from wherever he so chooses. Uh, so I don't know the answer to that, but personally VWAP, like all other indicators, is fractal. It'll work on the one, it'll work on the five, and it's the same on the one, it's the same on the five. It doesn't make a difference. How That's much different than when you're looking at the EMA or SMA, which will be different depending on what time frame you're looking at, VWAP won't. So. I like to use it on all time frames. I don't know about the anchor though. I like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, question here from King Zeus. It's a, it's tagged to you. You want to have a read through there? Yes, I, I was looking at this actually. Mm. Um, how does the time frame selected for VWAP calculations impact its relevance and effectiveness, especially in different trading styles? Um, that's a really good question. I think I was, um, we were kind of talking earlier too, and I don't know as much about longer term with VWAP, but I know Sharif was saying longer term adventure, uh, in adventures, investors mm -hmm. will, um, maybe investing is adventurous, who knows, but, um, but kind of base um, the placement of a stock above or below VWAP on the longer term time frame as kind of a gauge for how the stock is doing, right? I think shorter term, honestly, like if I'm going to go, so here I'm on the five minute, let's look at NVIDIA in like the 15 wow. minute now, see if there's a difference. Generally, Really, I think intraday, um, you're going to have about the same relationship um, with VWAP, to, to, regardless of what time frame you have. I think, like you're right, it's more of a going to be more of a difference if it's longer term. I think intraday, though, you're probably going to be a lot more receptive to those movements above and below VWAP um, because you're reacting to the market like kind of immediately, right? Also, I think the biggest difference with different intraday time frames for VWAP, <laughs> at least from my opinion, even if I, as I look at Nvidia here. Um, 
the movements are going to be a lot sharper because the candles are generally longer, especially in a stock as volatile as an NVIDIA. Like, as you can see here, we've kind of moved up and down VWAP in like two 15 minute candles. So yeah. uh, your relationship with VWAP is going to be a little bit different depending on what kind of candle time frame you're using. Um, if it's like a, a longer, like an hour or 15 minute, 30 minute um, intraday, but generally like the relationship is going to be the same. But yeah, I think it's interesting to think about longer term, um, VWAP is kind of more of a signal for investors because if you're moving above or below longer term VWAP, it might be a bit more significant of a level. Also, um, shout out to um, uh, DVR uh, D43 in the chat, suggesting a nickname, The Punisher, <laughs> that I just wanted to shout out. Yeah. I like that. And hold on. Um, someone said something else here that would uh, hold my beer says, I would agree with anything. Adarable says, have you ever been called Adarable? I don't think that, That's so. a new one for me. Yeah, anyway, I don't think adarable. I've heard that one. That's um, hilarious. Yeah. yeah, shout out to Jordan Smith. All right, good question from Zaire Kefa over here. Question for Sharif. Uh, yeah. <laughs> How do you use VWAP for penny stocks during power hour? I don't have a specific strategy for power hour. However, I, I am very aware of VWAP with what I, I don't want to call them penny stocks. I'm going to call them small cap gappers. They're small cap and they're typically gapping up from the previous day's close, hence why I call them gappers. Okay, I just want to make that very clear. And then the joke is they're crappers because crappers <laughs> sounds like gappers. So that's where the whole joke came from there. But I've stopped using the word crappers. Um, I am very cognizant of their, where VWAP is. Now, if, it, if the price action is north of VWAP, and then you have a key retracement into VWAP, I'll be interested in possibly getting a dip trade in and around there, okay? Um, like I would be for, for any other instrument re retracing into VWAP. That, that would be uh, an inclination. It wouldn't be a decisive matter. I would want to see how it's trading in and around there. If that, may, if that causes me to leave a bit of money on the table because I wait, to get it on the back end, as Neil likes to say. And by back end, it means essentially coming down into that VWAP area, showing that it is a respected level of support and then starting to curl back up and incrementally make higher highs. That's where I would get in, okay? So you're, I'm observing to see how the instrument that I'm trading is respecting or not respecting the volume weighted average price. As another rule, I will not take any, th any small cap gapper long that is south of VWAP. I will wait until it gets to VWAP, show that it's reclaiming VWAP um, and blowing through it as a level of resistance before I'm interested in getting it. That is not the same strategy that I employ for the large cappers, okay? I'm more interested in uh, key price action levels, usually a closing prints, lows of day, uh, some uh, a very specific support level on the daily chart for the big cappers than I am for the small cappers. So I just wanted to make that point. I don't have a specific strategy though for power hour. Okay, so let's just go here. Uh, by the way, uh, come to the chart, Ram Ram. Um, we had a decisive 16 break now of the GME the GME. We had multiple wicks into GME over here. The Katina man is long 15. He's smashing the bangs. He's amped up. And we got a 1641 high that, you know, he could, uh, you know, I would say wet his beak on, but he's already probably wetting his beak. Uh, 1641. He's already wet. <laughs> yeah. 1641 HOD, guys. We just broke through 1620 there. I think we had a 21 print, maybe a 20 print. Higher highs, all throughout, higher lows, all throughout, ever since breaking, you guessed it, VWAP over here, it's been one symphony of highs to the, high, to the upside over here on GME as it continues to trend up. Just want to make that point very quickly. All right, what are all these? I have a question actually, yeah, actually I just kind of realized as you were talking about, because um, I know you, you look more at the um, like closing or opening prints or longer term levels. Um, and forgive me if this was kind of already mentioned, but then I guess if VWAP crosses over one of those levels, would that make the VWAP then? Can you ask the question again? I think I'm wording this poorly. No, it's fine, go ahead. Um, but yeah, so I guess um, if we have, if we already have like an area of significance, um, like for example, if we're coming to like a closing um, print or an opening print and right. then you kind of see some 
confluence with something like Google, but that would be more significant. A hundred percent, hundred percent. So if there is like, yeah, that goes, uh, I mean, that's just bang on there. Yeah. If you have like, say, uh, you know, a closing print that you like, or a key area on the chart that you've identified as a level of support and resistance, and it happens to be kind of the same area, if not exactly at VWAP, all the better. The more indicators that point you to that price level being important, the better. Okay. Simple as that. The more price, the more indicators that point you at a particular price saying that this price is relevant, the better. If it's two, three, four, the more the merrier, so to speak, okay? Yes. So just want to talk about that. And now we can move on to fibs. Okay, so let's go ahead here and move on to everybody's favorite, Fibonacci's. People have been asking for this one for yeah, a while. they were requested. What the dang is Fibonacci? What is the Fibonacci sequence? Well, the Fibonacci sequence was developed by the Italian mathematician Leonardo Fibonacci in back all the way in the 13th century. The sequence of numbers starting with a zero and one is a steadily increasing series where each number is equal to the sum of the preceding two numbers. So let's just like kind of explain that over here. Yeah, it's... Yeah, here we go. So... Let's look at uh, this over here, Ram Ram. There we go. So we have one and then two and then three. Why do we have three? Because two and one equal three. Then we have five. Well, why do we have five? Because three and two equal five. Keep going. Eight. Why do we have eight? Because five and three equal eight, et cetera. You guys get it. Thirteen, five and uh, eight and five equal 13. So that's basically it. The sum of the preceding two numbers equal the current number. That's what, fib, that's what uh, a Fibonacci sequence is. Some traders believe that Fibonacci numbers and ratios created by the sequence play an important role in finance that traders can apply um, using different methods. Okay. Understanding the fibs. Before I show you uh, how I use fibs on my chart here, let's just talk a little bit about more, uh, more, more of this technical stuff. Understanding the Fibonacci sequence. The numbers in the Fibonacci sequence don't equate to a specific formula. However, the numbers tend to have certain relationships with each other. For example, each, again, each number is equal to the sum of the preceding two numbers. How to use them. The Fibonacci sequence can be applied to finance using four techniques. One is called retracements. The other is arcs. The other is fans. And the last is time zones. I'm only familiar with two of those. Uh, which is retracements and fans. I think we're only going to talk about retracements today because fans gets a little bit complicated. It's about drawing lines uh, from a particular area on the fib, uh, trend lines that uh, you know kind of look like a fan, like one of those handheld fans that you fan yourself with. I've, I've done that before. Obviously, retracements are the easiest ones to use. I've never used arcs, and I've never used time zones. So those two I'm unfamiliar with. But there are technically four ways that you can use fibs and trading, okay. Fibonacci retracements require two price points chosen on a chart, usually a swing high or a swing low. Once two points are chosen, the Fibonacci numbers and lines are drawn at percentages of that move. Now we're gonna talk about this, okay? So let's use on GME over here, come to the chart chart, Ram Ram. Right? I can tell you did it on purpose yeah. that time. I always say We're going to make a t-shirt called Chart Chart Ram Ram. It would be a great uh, merch. So the way that I use it on my platform, I just have an option here, Fibonacci Retracement Extension, and I click that bad boy, and you can take it from the low. Now, one of the questions is, do you take it from the wick low, or do you take it from the closing print? You know how I feel. I'm more of a closing print type person, so we're going to go to the closing print over here. And then you drag, and you drag from the low to the high. Again, you know, there's a whole thing about where do I drag from? Is it the, the closing print or is it the top wick? Or let's just go like this. And then it gives you a series of lines. The ones that show up, the ones that I'm more concerned with are that 23% uh, level. Sorry. Um, the one that I care about the most is, oh, I can't even see it. 38.2 and 61.8 and 50. So three. Three different areas, although it charts here 23.6, 38.4, 50% exactly, 61.8, 76.4, and 100. So what I get on mine are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 
The first two, obviously, I needn't concern myself with. It's the 100% and the 0%. Right, because those are obvious levels in and of themselves. They are the high and the low. The, in, the, the intervening ones over here from 23 to 76 are the ones that I concern myself with. And so the way that it's typically used is you chart it from a breakout point to the high, and what you're looking for is a retracement into one of these levels. Now, it may retrace into 61 or may retrace into 50 or 38. Again, you're gonna have to wait until the price action develops at that level to see, is that particular level being respected? If it's not, then it's irrelevant. Move on, right? Mm -hmm. In this particular, you know, I don't know what the data is. I don't know, uh, you know, what the, the odds of it retracing into 61 as opposed to 38 are. I don't know what, or, or, you know, maybe it makes a difference what equity you're trading, small caps retrace into this, large caps retrace into that. But that's exactly kind of how you do it there. Moving on, Fibonacci retracements are, most, are the most common form of technical analysis based on Fibonacci sequences. So these are the retracements that I'm talking about over here. During a trend, Fibonacci retracements can be used to determine how deep a pullback may be. Traders tend to watch the Fibonacci ratios between, like I said, 23.6 and 78.6 during these times. If the price stalls near one of the Fibonacci levels and then start to move back in the trending direction, an investor may trade in that trending direction. So again, you're going to have to wait to see what the price action does at these particular levels in order to know whether it's relevant or not. Now, all of this presupposes that you've charted from the right level, right? So if you start taking your FIB uh, and charting it from up here rather than from down here, which is to me the, the better level because clearly you have a double bottom here, right? Then you're gonna get an incorrect data because you'll have charted your 0% from 1520 on GME rather than from 1485. You follow me? Yeah. No, I was just going to say, this sounds really complex and really easy to get wrong because if you chart wrong, you could completely, Absolutely. like, would that, I would guess that would impact your stop loss and your profit taking positions, right? Absolutely. So it seems, it seems You're... like if you can do it well, then i uh, credit to you. Someone in the chat was saying that mm -hmm. actually um, crypto really likes fibs, um, so, which I did not realize. But yeah, so it's interesting, interesting. Um, though, to think about the fact that, and this would kind of make me nervous as someone who, I enjoy math, I enjoy mathematical aspects, but yeah, if you get it wrong, it seems like it could really impact your trade. You're absolutely bang on. So uh, that's part of the things that you have to practice. And again, um, like I've been saying, you know, you really need to prove profitability in the sim before you ever use mo real money. And this is part of proving profitability in the sim is to also employ your indicators that you'd like to actually use in the wild in real life, right? And then see how you can kind of use them and, and learn from them. Bang on. Huh. Um, quickly, uh, GME has now retraced back into $16. That is a level that I've earmarked as an interesting uh, resistance level prior. It could now be support. Let's see if uh, it switches from resistance to support there. It's up 18.5% on the day. It's doing its darndest to stay above 16. So interesting level on GME, retracing into 16. Let's see if it holds that 16 and makes a new high. So far, we have higher lows. We haven't given up the ghost, right? Um, so let's see if this 16 level ends up holding up or, or what. We're going to have to wait and see. It's actually coming down into that 78 Point four level on the fib, so oh, I'm looking good here. Okay, no, I think it's obviously more to do with 16 than uh, with uh, with that 78.6, 78.4 level on fibs. I like uh, the I like the attempt to bring it back to the fibs. Though. Why not? Right, right? <laughs> it came back for. into that topic. Reliable Rudy. Hey, to add to the topic, I recommend adding a 0.702 retracement on your fib tool. The halfway between 70. Uh, 78.6 and 618. I actually don't have an option, at least on my platform, enabled to be in order to do that. I probably have to calculate it mathematically, but thank you for that recommendation, Reliable. Shout out to you, my man. I hope you're printing on VVOS because that's a small cap gapper du jour. Um, all right, guys. Patrick Langwa, Sharif. Charting top to bottom versus bottom to top has a difference. I like to think it's the direction. Puts or calls. Didn't figure it out yet. Okay, interesting. I actually haven't heard that before. I don't know how it would make a difference because you would have your zero point 
at the top or your zero point at the bottom, and it would either be 100% at the bottom or 100% on the top. So explain that one to me a little bit. But interesting, I like how you have a different take on it. Uh, Tony Majid, I Sharif. Uh, does PLTR reverse head and shoulders? I'll have a look, even though we're not talking about head and shoulders today. Uh, I'll oblige. I talk about knees and toes later, but we'll see. <laughs> right? we'll see I don't see a head and shoulders on PLTR um, right now, um, at least on the one-minute chart. Let me flip to the five. No. No, this is, this is just you know highs and lows. This could be an ABCD pattern. We haven't gotten to that yet. A bit more complicated of a pattern. But yeah. No, I don't, uh, I don't uh, think that there is uh, head and shoulders on PLTR. Let me look at the daily. No, no, not for me. All right. Any other questions with respect to fibs? Or, uh, but not actually a view up because we're going to get to there in a second. If you have, he said reverse head and shoulders. I didn't see a reverse head and shoulders either. I mean, you could kind of look at it like this. Okay, come to the chart, Rammer. Here's the five-minute look. Uh, here, this could be the left shoulder over here, the head, the right shoulder. To me, that, that ain't it. But let's just wait and to see how, how it works out. Besides, don't forget that a reverse head and shoulders, to be like a really reverse head and shoulders, it has to be followed by a downtrend. It is a reversal pattern, guys, okay? An inverse head and shoulders should be preceded by a downtrend because it reverses the previous trend. So just because you, you think you see a head and shoulders, there has to be other factors that are taken into consideration before you see that as well. So don't forget that, okay? That's a consolidation, just says John. Yeah, I see it's just an ABCD pattern here. Uh, any questions, guys, with respect to FIBS before we, uh, before we take uh, like a five minute break and restart at one o'clock? Also, um, Sean has, uh, this is just a tweet over here. He sent this in our the little group chat. Yeah with his PLTR short, look at all these little profit takers, so that I would put that out um, for him because that was in the group chat. Shout out to the Katina. Shout man. out, this is a beautiful short. And I am very proud of myself for predicting what level he got in at. That's all, I yeah. love it. Yeah. Right, I was like, I enjoyed the test. Also speaking of shorts, I yep. should address this meta short. I got in, I basically changed where I kind of wanted to put my stop loss and I don't say that because I, I only say that on technicals because I was looking and I was kind of trying to measure how long we kind of had before we had a retracement here um, in this previous, a uh, little pop. So we had from like kind of above that 332 to around just below that 334. So you have about a $2 range. So with that in mind, we started running again around like 331. So I gave myself till just below 333. Um, so a little bit wider of a stop loss because I, I kind of wanted to be more realistic about where we actually kind of have historically for charting the movement. Um, if we break above 333 decisively, bye bye meta, um, meh. But yeah, so I mean, um, we are seeing though, I'm happy I kind of reevaluated that using technical levels though, because we are seeing once we hit that 333.80 that I kind of calculated, we are seeing more of a pullback. Probably should have gotten involved in this a skosh later and done that math before I entered the trade um, and just kind of entering the second, I kind of saw a little bit of chop and churn and consolidation there. But hey, like evaluating, reacting and trying to improve um, my tactical elements. That's what we're all about here. Absolutely. In the midday area. There all right. Big Adam. Big Adam Deleuze. In regards to fibs, if you have a long at zero at the bottom, and if you have a short, the zero is at the top. Pretty straightforward. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you're looking for short, you've got to chart from the bottom to the top. Or if you're long from the bottom or from the top to the bottom, if you're long from the bottom to the top, I just don't think it makes much of a difference because what you're looking at here, let's let's look at GME, for example, where I charted this was, oh, what the hell is this? Yeah, let me flip it to the 10, there we go. Uh, when I Where I charted from GME, for example, uh, over here, Ram Ram, come to the chart. From over here, uh, it wouldn't really make a difference if that was, well, I guess it would make a difference actually. Yeah, no, what you're saying is accurate. I agree with you. If you're shorting, it's from the top to the bottom. And if you're going long, it's from bottom to the top. Yeah, should have made that very clear. All right, I'm long GME here because I really liked how oh, nice. it held 16. So I just took my first beak wetter there at 33s. Uh, shout out to the Katina man. He was long from 15. Uh, but I did love how it held that $16 level, which we had earmarked 
as a very clear uh, support area because it had been formally resistant. So let's see if we run up here. We're already up over 20% on the day. Let's see if we get maybe uh, increase that to 30 or 40. Uh, we'll have, I'm out below 16 though. The Katina man wants to know what I think about NVIDIA at, at three. 481. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a hell of a hold. Breakout. So I like the hold, Katina Man, because yesterday's closing print was that 478 and a quarter. I, I need the market to flip low before. Uh, yeah, look, I don't know. The Katina Man is thinking short here, NVIDIA, and I don't disagree with him. You're thinking long. Yeah, that's where I'm agreeing. Oh, you're agreeing. Yeah, absolutely. That 478 and a quarter uh, or a third, that was yesterday's close. And look, it held it to a T. Market's still green, but barely, yeah. All right, Katina Man, the Katina Man is now long NVIDIA at? You're long at? Nowhere. You're not long NVIDIA yet? I'm thinking about Oh, he's position. thinking. He's thinking about it. Okay. New All right. Position. New position. Yeah, NVIDIA breaking 481. I've been watching that one too because I was going to go short if we decisively failed 481, but we're still chopping and turning around there. Um, vanilla Man in America. That's hilarious. These names are just Which one? Vanilla Man in America. Oh, that's great. <laughs> I love it. It's All so right. specific. Would you say that keeping it simple is the best? Just the moving averages is better. VWAP, the 20 MA, the 200 MA, and maybe the 50 MA, knowing the side of the 20, knowing the side of the 20 and how far from the 20. Look, I think the, the more you can keep it simple, the better. If you can narrow down the indicators that you base your trades off, that, that's fantastic because you can master them, right? If you're using too many, it's gonna take longer to master all of them. If you're using a fewer, uh, fewer indicators, you can obviously get uh, the hang of them a bit better. Uh, I personally like the 200 EMA, Again, I talked about this, uh, did we do EMA uh, Monday, right? We did yeah. EMA on Monday. Monday. Yeah. I like the EMA uh, more than the SMA, the exponential moving average, more than the simple moving average for one simple reason. For day trading, I like the exponentially weighted because it takes more consideration of the recent price action and more heavily weights the recent price action as opposed to the historical one. So if you're looking at the 200 period moving average, day one, on the 200 is as equal in weight to day 199, okay? I personally don't like that. I'd like day 199 to be more important than the day one because it's a lot closer and much more has happened uh, since that time. So the 200 EMA, the 50, and VWAP. Those I will always have up on my charts, okay? And just so you know, blue is a 200, red, is the 50 and white is view up always on my charts never changes okay uh bisky what another nick sick name bro bisky sharif hello not related to fibs unfortunately but how do you get the mental confidence to enter trades that you want i'm currently doing doing good on charting but i'm always not budging i talked a little bit about this when we first started doing the lessons back in um i think Two weeks ago now, We're, this is week three of uh, the new midday show. And I talked about how the floor manager here, the one that was here, he left, his name was Greg. When I first started here and we were doing the lessons for the trainees in the back, I, I said that exact same thing to him. I'm like, Greg, you know, I'm charting. I like the levels. I feel like I have a good grasp on technical analysis, yet I'm having, it, I'm having trouble pulling the trigger. And he's like, look, man, you are suffering from the C word. And it's not the C word you guys are thinking of, you pervs in the chat. I'm kidding, of course. Uh, it is um, conviction. If you don't have conviction in your trades, uh, you're either going to take profits too quickly, you're going to stop out on the first pullback uh, before your stop loss. You're not going to have the confidence. Now, how do you get that confidence? It's not a button that you can hit that turns on the confidence. It's screen time, screen time, and more screen time. The more you see, the more you see the actual, uh, you know, the manifestation of technical analysis develop once, over, twice, three, four, five, six times. You're like, you get, you start believing in the system. You start seeing it over and over, and you get more confidence in it. And with that increased confidence comes more conviction. So I would say, Really stick to what you're doing. If you're charting well, keep doing it. Keep putting in those trades. And, you know, that will 
you know, accumulate gradually. But you're doing the right thing by being here. You're doing the right thing by understanding technical analysis and you're charting, you're doing your homework, stick to it, and it'll pay, my friend. Yeah. I mean, even something that, um, that Neil was saying to me when I kind of first started in the midday was there was this day, I think it was Micron. I was like, oh, it's moving, and then it actually was kind of moving in the direction I thought it was, but I never got in. And then after, uh, Neil kind of said something to the effect of, like, you know, if you're seeing some movement, if you're seeing what you think you know, it's kind of moving, just get into the trade because you learn more from actually being in the trade and having to monitor it. So yeah, shout out. I mean, everyone here has been like, you know, super helpful, I think with regards to kind of giving me confidence to just kind of try to trade everything and kind of see yeah. what works. But I think, yeah, that, that piece of advice really stuck with me. So now like when I see something moving, um, when I see, when I think I see a pattern, you know, I, I feel a little bit more emboldened to try and just dip my toe in and see what happens because I also definitely have that a lot where I'll get kind of worried. And that's why I'll tend to, sometimes I'll leave good trades early or I'll stay in uh, bad trades for too long because you kind of lose confidence, you lose courage. Um, someone said that they thought courage was going to be the C word, which is a valid point. It's There's also... Um, close. Yeah, I think it's yeah. kind of the same idea, right? Like I yeah. think you need conviction and courage yeah. along yes. with your charting to kind of get yes. to a trade. Also, um, Joe Doji in the chat saying, F-O-G-I, fear of getting in. Yeah, I think in addition to fear of missing out, I think that sometimes happens Absolutely. with trading, right? Absolutely. When you get worried it'll go wrong, so you just don't enter the trade. Um, but sometimes I think you need to hold on to your conviction, especially if you know you have solid charting reasons behind it, like the tape is working for you, you've thought about it. Um, sometimes just have, you know, believe that you do have um, what it takes for the trade, I guess, uh, but also be realistic. And I think that's kind of where at least I find I kind of have the most, success is a strong word, but I have the most um, work with trading. Your successful trades have been when you were confident in the position. Yeah, when I'm confident with the position and when I kind of Fair. check back in with myself and I plan, and I think part of that too is sometimes if you need to take profits early because things aren't going to the extent that you thought they were, sometimes you need to get out. I'm actually gonna use this meta trade as an example. Thank you for the bang button. Um, but so basically this meta trade, I initially was kind of getting worried because we got higher, but then I went back and I charted the amount that we actually had. Um, I like looked at the actual amount of, of dollars we had for that ride up and I was like until we get to that point I'm not going to get out we actually did have a pullback from where I, I charted that we would so I stayed in the trade and I'm really happy I did because if had I not checked back in with myself and said hey is this working how it should how are we doing I would have I would have lost some money and instead right now we're seven cents in um so you know small victories but yeah just kind of a <sighs> real a real time update I just hit the flatten key on my GME trade oh. I'm such a moron yeah, like this has happened before, and it's happening again. Oh, this happened in the video That's when you hit so the flat. That's so frustrating. Oh, my God. Anyway, whatever. It's only going to $23, Katina Man says. <laughs> you, Look said at this, bro. Look at it fly when I got out. I'm such an idiot. Ram, Ram, go to the chart, man. Let me complain here a little bit. Look at this go on, on Someone, real, on real. Delete that key. <sighs> no, it's not the same, Neil. <laughs> uh, I also love how like I did. It took me way too long when, when Sean was like, "Oh, it's okay. It's only gonna go to 23." Like just the calmness with which that was said too. Oh God, that's so, so frustrating. I'm such an idiot. Um, that's fine. Okay. Uh, all right, let's talk uh, next uh, topic. Any uh, any questions uh, not flatten button related? Yeah, there's some mentions <laughs> of the flatten button there in the chat. Is it a combination? Say that again. You have a one. I have different percentages flattened. There's a hundred percent, a fifty, and a quarter, and they're they're too close. I'm gonna put I'm gonna put right. them from F9 to F12 because they're at F1, two, three, and four. Say that again? Make it like control shift. Yeah, yeah, Neil's like, make it control shift something so that it takes longer to put Ooh. them in. Ooh. Eggs. More eggs. And there's the Moroccan couscous. I like the, the color spread there too. There's the greens and the very aut autumnal. Oh, God. Yeah, well, I, I took pro, but look at, look at it go, unreal. Anyway, let's uh, circle back, Adara, to uh, v, um, VWAP. Ram Ram, can you go to the first chart, please? No, she's. <laughs> All right, uh, you want to start uh, with uh, Let's VWAP? Let's start with um, VWAP. 
So what is VWAP? We talk about VWAP a lot, um, but what is it? So basically it's volume weighted average price, which is a measurement. It shows the average price of a security and it's adjusted for the volume. So it's calculated during a specific trading session. Um, you just take the total dollar value of the trading of the security and then it's divided by the volume of the trades. Uh, so the formula for calculating it is a cumulative typical price. Uh, Static. Times the volume divided by the cumulative or the total volume. Um, and why is it important? Um, so it basically gives traders like a smoothed out indication of a security's price. So as you can see here, mine is always the teal, this turquoise, this turquoise is my volume. Um, and it kind of, uh, yeah, it's right there. Here we go. Here's the turquoise, um, still in this meta short. But yeah, um, so it basically, um, it, it is a smoothed out indication of the securities price that you can actually see. And so you can see, are we trading above the volume weighted average price or below? And that can be interesting with regards to, I know Sharif was saying earlier today, and he says this quite a lot, if um, a small cap is below VWAP, it's not really like worth looking at for a long because it's kind of fallen below what the volume weighted average price was for that session, right? So it can be used, it can be used to like gauge a point of entry or gauge the relative strength or weakness of a stock uh, within that period. So are we above VWAP, are we strong for the day or are we below VWAP, we're weaker for the day, right? Um, and so it also is used pretty heavily by institutional traders, which is something I learned recently. And it allows them to ensure that their trades don't move up, uh, don't move the price of the security they're trying to buy or sell too extremely. Um, so for example, a hedge fund could um, refrain from submitting a buy order for the price if it goes above the security's view up um, in order to avoid like artificially inflating the price of the security or avoid, yes, yeah, so that's kind of what that is used for with VWAP with regards to institutional money, which is an interesting thing I kind of more recently learned. Um, and how do we use uh, VWAP? So it can be used in different ways. Like I was saying to, you know, Sharif will talk about using it as kind of a level to gauge um, getting involved in, for example, for small caps, right? Because small caps are going to be a lot more receptive, a lot of its intraday movement. So if you're going to look at a small cap intraday, for example, what was running today? VVOS? Uh, let me pull up VVOS. Yeah, so VVOS, very much above VWAP, right? So we're still up 300%. We can still see we're pretty strong on the day. Um, if it fell a bit below VWAP, then it might kind of be like we're faded off a little bit in the day, right? So another example of using um, relationship with VWAP to gauge relative strength on the day is Tesla. So Tesla, um, once we fell below VWAP, now it's recovering a little bit. But I was saying earlier, part of what inspired me to get involved in that short I decided that, you know, we kind of had that break below VWAP and then we were seeing, in addition to that break, looking for confluence, shout out to Obi, lower high, lower high, lower high, and lower lows. So that kind of that break of the VWAP showed a bit of weakness in the stock, right? So you can kind of use VWAP in a multitude of ways to kind of uh, confirm strength or weakness of a stock. And so, um, yeah, v traders can use VWAP as a trend confirmation tr uh, tool Looking and build trading rules around it. Okay, GME. Um, so they might consider stocks prices below VWAP as undervalued $2 and prices the money. above it um, as overvalued. And so if a price below VWAP move above it, then traders can go long on the stock because they're seeing, oh, we've crossed above VWAP. It, it you know, can be seen as a sign of strength or a show of you know, relative strength in the stock. So yeah, VWAP, um, very interesting sometimes for gauging whether you want to enter or exit a trade that can sometimes be what it's used for. However, um, VWAP isn't always necessarily going to be useful or relevant for every stock at every time, right? So um, like I was saying earlier with Tesla, and I, you know, I'll just pull up Tesla again. Um, Tesla with regards to, to VWAP, earlier in the day we were really hugging VWAP here, right? Really close to VWAP, and then now VWAP is kind of less of a level for Tesla. We drop below it, uh, but now if we kind of come back into VWAP around this 250 area, then uh, VWAP could be of interest for Tesla again, right? So sometimes uh, this is the case with all indicators, but definitely uh, VWAP is one, especially because it's literally just a line. Sometimes we can kind of come into play. Stocks can play around this indicator at different times. So VWAP might not always be relevant for every stock, but it's always worth keeping an eye on if we're above or below it. That's kind of my my take on VWAP. Is it GameStop? Oh my God, 25%. I'm sorry. <laughs> Look at GameStop. What, what a rocket ship. 17 uh, top there for now. Key word or key phrase for now. 17 top. Uh, you know, these whole dollar levels, they're always going to be for to me anyway, uh, important levels of support and resistance. Uh, we saw the dance with 16 earlier, then we saw the decided break above 16, and then in typical fashion, 
technical analysis comes back into play, resistance becomes support, you get a dip into 16, and then boom goes the dang dynamite. You move up a buck off that retracement. I'm talking about this retracement over here, down into 16, and then boom, you go all the way up into that 17. Great, great. Um, who's calling me? Oh, that's the my way guy. Can I give this to you for a second? Yes, absolutely, yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, VWAP, um, yeah, I guess some of the other, um, basically some of the other limitations of VWAP to kind of continue chatting about VWAP here. So it is a single day indicator, restarts at the open of each new trading day. So attempting to create like an average VWAP over many days, although anchored VWAP does exist, um, can sometimes distort VWAP um, to different, you know, different um, areas and can result in an incorrect indicator. Um, some institutions do prefer to buy when the price of the security is below VWAP or sell when it's above, but VWAP is not the only factor to consider. So like we've been saying with every indicator this week, same with um, the patterns last week as well, you always have to check for confirmation. Um, sometimes if that's in other time frames or if that's in other indicators. So like if you're like, oh, I like, you know, this thing around VWAP, what's it doing with volume? Is there volume around that move, right? So kind of looking at not just using one singular indicator, VWAP included, to make trading decisions um, because that it cannot always, it's not always necessarily going to be accurate here. Um, also, shout out to Jay's Passion with the 499 Super Chat. Do you think Mark Cuban will put his money into Tesla after him selling the Davis, Dallas Mavericks? Um, I don't know if this question is directed at me or Sharif, probably not directed at me. Um, but no, I think it's interesting. I mean, he is still going to be in some control, I believe, of um, the team itself. I think he still has, I'm going to look up the specifics of that. But I don't think he's like fully giving up everything with the Mavericks, I believe. Um, I was shocked, though, when I saw that headline. Because um, I, like, you know, I, I've seen Shark Tank and I, I've been aware of Mark Cuban's involvement in the Dallas Mavericks for a while. So it was, it was pretty surprising. Um, he's already apparently said he has no plans to run for president as a result of this deal. So I think just what's happening is a lot of people are assuming now because of this change up with the Mavericks that um, Mark Cuban has all these different plans. I think we'll have to wait and see. I mean, who knows? I, someone in the Super, uh, super That's Chat asked That's what Brenda about, was saying to me. Yeah, today, Mark uh, Cuban and Tesla. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's interesting though, because Tesla, like, there is a Texas Gigafactory, right? Yeah, awesome. Dallas Mavericks. Mm, okay. But yeah. yeah, who knows? I can't really actually answer. Okay. Uh, GME is absolutely flying to the high side. It just broke 17. Let's see how we deal with that uh, or the whole dollar resistance level, whether we get through it. Looks right now that we're holding above it. This, this one could squeeze. Guys, what's the short float? Do we know the short float on GME? 20 something percent? Okay. So it's not negligible by any means. Um, so great look on GME today, 26 and two thirds. Say that again, 23%. The Katina man just advised me, uh, uh, GME, the percentage of the short float is 23%. Good move, fantastic move. Six times volume, times volume Arval, relative volume. Maybe that's one thing we should talk about too yeah, in the future, I think relative I have some volume. Arval, Arval is very so. important as well. All right, guys, uh, did you get through VWAP or is there anything that you um, I think on I now? got through VWAP. I'm just gonna look over and see if there's anything. Um, okay, yeah, there is one more thing. So yeah, just the fact, this is kind of the case with all the indicators because VWAP is based on historical values. It doesn't inherently have any quote unquote predictive qualities, right? So all these indicators are gonna be more lagging, right? They're, they're based on past yep. data, past information. Um, so VWAP is anchored to the opening price range of the day. So the indica indicator will actually become laggier, a word that we keep using, um, regardless of whether or not it is real, <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. as the day goes on, right? And so this can also be seen in the way that a one period, uh, one minute period VWAP calculation after 330 minutes, which is uh, the length of an average typical trading day, will often resemble a 390 minute moving average at the end of the day, which yep. is a new thing that we learned, I think, today, or at least so I learned today. Yeah, let's look at some uh, fib, um, not fibs, um, VWAP retracements or holds in the wild over here. PDD has been an absolute rocket, an absolute rocket, okay? Uh, whether on the daily, the hourly, it doesn't really matter. Pendo Duo has been doing it. Now look what we get. We get the big move down after that nice move up into 145. We got to technically 144.87. We're starting to curl back up here off that hold off yesterday's close. So Look at this closing print, this, this uh, horizontal white line, not there for no reason. That is yesterday's closing print. Look where it bounced off, exactly 
off yesterday's closing print. Now where is it finding resistance? VWAP. So we know that number one, we always kind of knew for a fact that yesterday's closing print was gonna probably be important, okay? Whether or not it holds for the, for the entirety of the day is, is a different story, but typically you'll get an initial bounce off it, if not just for a short period. Now we're moving up into that 141. We have VO up at 141 and a third. So we're finding three candles of resistance right around that level. So that's one, that's PDD. Have a look at Zscaler. We talked about Zscaler coming into VO up. Now it is literally hugging VO up and has been since around 1130, okay? This likely not by accident, okay? Uh, very tight consolidation as the volume drops off here at volume weighted average price around 203 and a half. That's Zscaler. Look what the Fuge did this morning, the NQ, after that big move up into 16.2 and then the bounce off 16.1. Look where we found reje that rejection that we made a newer low, VWAP. So VWAP comes into play a lot. Again, the key factor is look to see if the instrument that you are trading is respecting the indicator that you want to use. If it's not, don't use it. Okay, it is just gonna throw you off. So great look right now um, for, uh, for, yeah, no, I was gonna say great look for GME, but it looks like it's coming right back down 1690 or so. All right, uh, let's move on to Fibs, Fibonacci's. This is about an, an easier one to talk about. Let's move these charts out of the way and bring in that single chart. Oh, sorry, I forgot to take questions from the chat. Guys, any questions about um, VWAP before we move on? Oh, Harry Lou, he's got one. Sharif, how does VWAP compare to volume by price indicators in terms of responsiveness? Are, are you talking about the volume bars that we have at the bottom of, um, of the chart? Like, come to the chart, Ram Ram. Uh, over here, like, you know how on the bottom we have the volume bars? Is that what you're talking about? How does VWAP compare to volume by price indicators in terms of responsiveness? I'm not exactly sure what you mean by that. Um, I guess maybe expand a little uh, on uh, your question. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, any other questions, guys? Put them in the chat, baby. Uh, Redna, one, Sharif, how do you set up your parameters on VWAP and how do you set up your time frame? Okay, so VWAP is a, a, an indicator that restarts daily save and accept for the anchored VWAP. Anchored VWAP is an anomaly. It is kind of created, um, you know, differently. Every day at 4 a.m. when the market opens, you have a new data set off which VWAP will populate, okay? It really depends, sort of, I shouldn't have said 4 a.m. because it depends on your platform. My platform, I'm allowed to trade from 4 a.m. So the charts start populating from 4 a.m. When we come here on the floor, the chart starts populating, what is it, 6 a.m.? 6 a.m. on PPRO8. So VWAP will be anchored from the first price that printed at 6 a.m. on PPRO8. On my platform, it's gonna start from 4 a.m., okay? Now that sometimes has a bit of a variance, especially with the small cap gappers, right, that have more price fluctuations throughout the day, right? These small cap gappers like VVOS, is up 300 some odd percent, especially if it started running in the pre-market, like say it had a big move between four and 6 a.m. that's not being accounted for on PPRO8, but it is on my platform. Uh, I'll compare the PPRO8 chart and uh, my platform's chart, and there'll be a bit of a difference, okay? So when you need to know what time your, your chart starts populating. Say it again, Katina Min. So for e-signal, the Katina man says, you can actually specify the time that you want VWAP to populate. I don't think I have that option on mine. I'm gonna have a quick look here, um, but I'm pretty sure that doesn't give me the option to do that. Let's go ahead, chart parameters, we'll go to studies, and right over here we have intraday VWAP. So what I have is, these are the following uh, options that I have. I have standard deviations, which is set to 1.0, and then the intraday VWAP period, which is one, okay? Is there another? Uh, intra no, there isn't. Look, when I type in volume weighted, look at that. Volume weight weighted moving average, that's not what I want. I want volume weighted average price, and the only one that comes up is uh, VWAP, the intraday one. And so, you know, I don't have the anchored VWAP um, option on this platform. I'll have to use trade ideas. Shout out to trade ideas in the NOS boss over there. 
So yeah, that's, um, that's the only time uh, parameter that I have. Um, Redna, Redna 1. I'm looking for more questions here. Lolo says GME 22 to 23 out of the money calls was wilding since yesterday. Yeah, I bet they were. What are the premiums on them? Let me know, by the way, because the premiums are probably shooting up right now. Uh, something tells me. Um, all right, any other questions here? Good, got some tags. Lincoln, how similar are VWAP and VPRV? I don't even know what VPRV is. Let me have a VPRV. One sec. Technical analysis. What is this? Volume profile visible range? I don't have an idea what volume. I know what volume profile is, if that's what you're talking about, where you know you see the bar charts on the side and it shows you where the majority of the volume took place. That, you know, a lot of the traders use that on the floor. We don't have it sadly on our platform or on mine. I know it's available on TradingView. Uh, I personally don't use it because I don't have a TradingView account, but I do like it. I know a lot of traders on the floor use volume profile, and it, essentially what it does, it, it, come to the chart, Ramon. Uh, essentially, instead of having bar charts on the bottom, they're on the side, and then it shows you the bar charts on the side. It shows you where the majority of the volume took place at what price. Uh, I thought Aaron was talking to me because Aaron actually, the machine gun uses volume profile. Hmm, uh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, he does. He sneezes, and he also uses volume profile. Uh, Fry Rai, how do you know if VWAP is actually, uh, actually holding to buy in? And that's a great question. Again, you're gonna have to leave some money on the table. If you're going to rely on VWAP, either as a resistance level or a support level, you can guess, you can wait, you can put your order at VWAP there and then have a tight stop, right, if, if the uh, price, uh, price levels uh, allow it. Or you can wait for the price to bounce off or reject off VWAP and get it on the, the curl. Neil says, you know, getting it on the back end. That's what he likes to say. And what I mean by that is, come to the chart, Ram Ram. So let's just say that this bounced off VWAP here. I know it doesn't. Let's, let's just say it does, okay? So over here, it comes into VWAP, it holds, and then it starts curling back up. You, you wait for VWAP to show you that it's being respected and the, for the price to curl back up before you start getting in. By definition, you are leaving money on the table because you could have been long, say on GME, 1550, but instead you got long 1575, and that's part of the, uh, part of the game. You're gonna have to leave money on the table if you want confirmation, and that's part of the whole risk to reward thing. Okay. Um, going down, let's just make sure that there are no other questions before we move on. Volume by price is rather helpful for futures, okay? Uh, cheeky tax on trading view VWAP has upper and lower bands. What is the purpose of the bands? I don't know why VWAP has upper and lower bands on my trading view platform. It doesn't VWAP's just one line So I, I don't know how to help you on that um, Moving down Any other questions Lincoln thanks for the reply John Del Segno. Let's go cat pumping out of a fat W really caterpillars moving up Woo! Caterpillar is up 1.15%. Nice. I'm kidding. I mean, I'm still underwater on it. That's the truth. Uh, I'm, I've added. I like the optimism, though. Yeah, like yeah. Well, this is a longer-term play because we're going to have to build homes because millennials can't live in their parents' basements anymore. I mean, right? they like, might think they, they can. Huh? They might think they can. <laughs> yeah, they might get kicked out eventually. We are going to have one of the biggest wealth transfers in the history of history when the millennials take over the boomers' money. That money's really? going to get passed down. The money's yeah, not gonna, that's a good point. Right? It's going to be the biggest transfer of wealth uh, in recent times. And, you know, they're going to buy houses sometime. Yeah. So we'll have to wait and see when that actually happens. Um, Harry Lou, Sharif, volume profile is similar to volume by price. So is there any difference in what you call volume profile and VWAP responsive? Yeah, volume profile, from my understanding, just shows you where the majority of the volume took place at. So you can see where the, the, more, the most involvement was. Um, volume weighted average price is just a different mathematical uh, calculation. It shows you the total volume by dollar uh, divided by the number of trades. So the math is a little different on both. Um, moving down, flop. Uh, well, I don't know if I want to answer this because he's a Liverpool guy, but it's all good. <laughs> I'm kidding. Shout out to the Neil. 
What's a more bullish pattern signal? Arsenal winning today or Arsenal losing? You're hilarious, Klopp. You know, and I always give you props too, and I, I big up Liverpool. I never, I never talk bad about Liverpool like I do about Manchester United. Hey, you do not like Man U. No, I don't like Man U at all. Um, that goes down back to a friend of mine that I had back in, uh, in school. He was a Man U fan, and we were always competing. Um, in any event, look, Arsenal's going to win against Lons today. Yesterday, apparently, I said it wrong. I said Lens, and I was, I was uh, scolded in the chat. It's yeah, Lons. Lons. they got to do it the French way, Lons. right? Um, I think Arsenal wins handedly. We're already up nine points. Handedly, Probably got 12, like yeah. That. There you go. Also, um, go there's a, a question here in the chat that I like. Um, when is it not good to enter when the price is already above VWAP? So shout out to Noam is my name. I'm so sorry if that, that I pronounced that um, inappropriately or like incorrectly there. But yeah, I mean, I think when is it not appropriate to enter VWAP as a long? I think it really like depends, right? Like if you're seeing kind of continuation, if you're seeing somewhere to buy within there, then I think that's valid. And like I think we were talking, I was talking about earlier, um, it's always best with every indicator to look for confirmation in other areas, right? So let's see we're above VWAP and you also see like a bull flag. That might be a good time to enter, right? Like I think you really, I can't think of any examples right now, but I think if you do want to go like, for example, long and we're above VWAP or um, long and we're like, like, you know, you don't know how much higher we're going to go. I would say, are you seeing continuation? Are you seeing some pullback? Are you seeing signs of reversal? Also, maybe look at volume. Like, what are we doing volume-wise? Do you know what I mean? Because sometimes volume um, can play a role as well. We were saying this. Everything kind of oftentimes, the more volume you have, the stronger the move is. So I would say look for some confirmation in some other indicators before you really jump in there in on... Um, in on that trade, but yeah, I do. I th I get what you mean. Like it is. It's always a little bit scarier to know to enter a trend when it's already kind of in the midst of happening. You don't want to be too late to the game. I would say look for other um, confirming factors if you see them. At, it, you know, even if we are above VWAP, it's not the be all end all of all indicators. So yeah, look for conf confirmation. Look for sorry confluence. Uh, yeah, just look for other factors. Oh, you said confluence. I did. My say bad. Sorry, I didn't hit the. Shout mic. out to Obi. Where is he, Buck? He's not there. I, every, every time I say confluence, I feel like I'm like you know like copying the trademark, but it's just a really useful trading word. It's a really useful word. To Max's with. desk has been empty for like three days. He's probably on another vacation. That guy, unreal. Um, all right, quickly here, I want to mention the the uh, NQ. It held beautifully yesterday's closing print. And look at it curling back up, possibly into that 16.1. We know 16.1 is likely going to be resistance, not just because it's the 100-point level, but we also definitely had a bit of a dance at 16.1 where it acted as support. So keep your eye, if you're trading the future, the Qs or whatever, any derivative thereof, uh, keep your eye on 16.1, okay? All right, one more question here in the chat before we move on to Fibs. Uh, the Boring Man, the best name in the chat. Is VWAP more reliable than a moving average or the SMA and EMA and MCDM? I'm assuming you mean... Um, MCAT? Yeah. Um, Mac oh, no, D. I did. MACD. Mac you, 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 you did it this time. You did it this time. Before entering a trade. Uh, that is a good question. Um, I'm going to tell you I don't have the statistical data to back this up, but my observations have been that intraday VWAP is a more respected level than either the 200 EMA or the 50 EMA, which is what I use. I use EMAs, I don't use SMAs. However, on the daily chart, when you are charting critical levels, I think, again, I don't have the data to support this. This is more anecdotal or observational. When you come into the 200 EMA, for example, or the SMA on the daily, it's, it's definitely a very important level, okay? And you hear fundamental investors talk about this all the time. It's trading above its 200-day moving average. It's trading below its 200-day moving average. Uh, I would say on the daily, you are likely, uh, I would lean towards moving averages. Intraday, I would use more of volume-weighted average price. That's been my, uh, my observation. Again, don't have the evidence to support it. I could do some research to find out if that's accurate or not. All right, Matthew Cabrell, I couldn't agree more with Sharif. I have 16103 to 16098 level marked for a potential short on IQ. Kill it, my friend. Just don't kill it too much because I'm long Apple and you know it'll Ooh. it'll retrace uh, yeah. and then you know that's and not then you can't be. buy buy Starbucks. <laughs> 
Yeah, I, well, I didn't actually have to buy anybody Starbucks. Yeah, because it Remember did not. Lee? Yeah. No, it was Lee oh, this week. Oh, get it, 45 dollars for Lee, and thank God Lee's at thirty something right now, making me but then, sweat but you, again. But you're betting against yourself too, right? Yeah. Because that's the funny thing about it is because like, <laughs> Ramiz, you don't want this, it to get. Please to look at her hitting the fail over and over. Because you don't want it to get high, because then you have to buy Starbucks. But then yeah. also, if it's low, you still own the look, stock, right? Look, so. I'll gladly get you Starbucks if Lee <laughs> runs up to fifty-six bucks, man. Like, let me. I. Just, this trade has been making me sweat for a while. That's All right, funny. James Pang, do you personally prefer to trade VWAP breakouts or VWAP pullbacks? Thank you. I don't have a problem uh, with either. It really That's depends on the question. setup. Yeah, yeah, it is a very I good question. I agree with the setup thing. Yeah, yeah. shout out James Pang. Uh, very good question there. Look, uh, I, I think it's going to be uh, instrument related. Uh, so if we're depressed on the day, if we're down, by depressed, I mean like down on the day. If we're down, say, 5% on the day, and then we, all, we get a nice bounce back, maybe off a critical whole dollar level or a, a previous uh, important support level, and then we retrace back into VWAP, I'll be personally looking to go with the trend, which is down. So I'll be looking for the short at VWAP. However, if we're up on the day and we retrace back into VWAP, pull back, I'll be looking long because I'm a trend trade. I go with the trend. I don't mean revert trade. That's just not my style, right? And so it really is contextual. That's what I would say to you on that. I hope that helps. Moving down, Fry Rye. How do you know what the Fibonacci and VWAP are respecting each other, give, giving you an entry? Watch, observe. Is, is the, the, the price action coming down to VWAP and then showing you uh, that it's finding support at that area, or is it just blowing through it like it doesn't even matter? You need to make observations. There's not gonna be a hard and fast rule. Uh, again, I, I keep saying this, look for the instrument to respect the indicator that you're using. If there is no respect, if it's not upholding it, it's not holding on to it, move on, don't use it. It's obviously not right in that context. Uh, James Appling, Adara, Sharif, new name. Tradera sounds like trade Aria? I don't know about that. Yeah, okay. I, said, I feel like the good, Punisher good one earlier was like that. I feel like that one is my, like the Punisher. I, yeah, right? okay, okay. Um, I'm open though. I love everybody's suggestions are, are right? very entertaining. No, every, they're, they're great guys. I don't mean to put any down. Keep bringing them. Uh, we want this uh, to happen uh, organically here. Yeah. Uh, I know that's your whole thing this morning. Was yeah, like organic no, I'm not thing. forcing this. Yeah. <laughs> um, Sally Huang wants to know if the Katina man is in Tesla. Correct. Price, please. <laughs> 249 short, Ooh, Sally. Nice. So be made aware. The Katina man. No, no bids. No bids. He doesn't have any bids out at the moment. So shout out to Sally Huang. I wonder if she's related to Jensen. Um, yeah, whatever. <laughs> he lied. He has a bid at 240. 247.60. <laughs> Whatever, Ram Ram, leave him alone. He's talking to me. Ram Ram's so bossy back there, eh? She's trying to like get everybody to do what she wants and stuff. Yeah, I know. She's demanding Starbucks. She wants uh, the Katina man to use the mic. Like, geez, Ram Ram. <sighs> Pretty funny. Uh, Sally Huang, Huang has clarified she's not related to Jensen. No! LOL. Thank you for playing along with us. Yeah, we're just kidding, by the way, Sally. Yeah. Uh, show, thanks for We're always here, talking bro. about um, how Jensen and Lisa Sue are related. So that's kind of why that's funny, too. It's a uh, hell of a family. They yeah, got over the, there, the fact man. that they're third cousins or something and they grew up in the Unreal. same city in Taiwan. You were saying that's crazy. Yeah, town, actually. So even smaller. Uh, Elon, yeah. shout out Elon. Hi, Sharif. Speaking of Lee, any comments on Lee's L9 versus the Lucid Gravity? They look very similar in my opinion. What you need to understand about Lee is they've taken the iPhone approach to car making. All their cars look alike. They're just different sizes. So the L8, I believe there's the L6, the L9. They, they are all the same, just different sizes, like the iPhone. You get the iPhone, uh, you know, the regular or the Pro Max. They look identical, just one's bigger than the other. And, you know, that could be a good thing. That could be a bad thing. <laughs> Didn't realize uh, I was on camera when I took that It's all good. Dog. For Lee Auto, I don't have a comparison uh, with Lee Auto as L9 and the new Lucid, uh, what they call it the Gravity, I'm, I'm pretty sure. The Lucid Gravity. I don't, I think the Lucid Gravity is a beautiful car. No question about that. Let's see if they can make them and let's see if they can sell them. That's going to really be the, uh, the question here because they've been having trouble doing both, quite frankly. Um, 
All right, the boring man. What does no bids mean when you ask Sean? That means he doesn't have any profit takers for his short set out. He does now. And he ready. Go for it, Katina man. Ooh, there yay. he is. There is a Katina man fl flushing Tesla down the toilet. The Piper, last hour of the day, you can call her Power Adara. Oh, for power hour? Okay, all right, all right. You've made your opinion. <laughs> made your opinion. Uh, uh, why not? Uh, Ram Ram just uh, said something in my ear, but she's requesting that I don't say it out loud. I'm bidding now 248. The Katina man is now bidding uh, a profit taker on his Tesla short at 248. I love that he's just I appeared. love that thing, bro. I'll put it up. It's freaking hilarious. I love it. It's like. <laughs> no, I was just, yeah, I like that it just appears too. Right? It's a little animated. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Atta boy. The Katina man just took 80 cents on the Tesla short, so if you. All right. Uh, I like Sister Swoop, says Fee Rhymes with AMC. Sister Swoop? No, man, it's kind of like, yeah. Well, it doesn't actually have to rhyme with your name because uh, the Chilean nightmare doesn't round. I was going to say, yeah, that, all, that, it's, right? just, it's, a, it's just a nickname. It's yeah. just such a fantastic, strong nickname. He's a nightmare. Be, be fearful of him, <laughs> right? <laughs> So I, like, I like Fabian. He's off, obviously awesome. Sorry for all the questions, says Fry Rye. We're uh, here for questions, yeah. Exactly. Uh, but this is what I'm struggling with, and you're helping a lot. However, do you think using the Bollinger Bands as support and resistance points a good idea? Look, if you're going to use Bollinger Bands, I'm not going to tell you not to. What I would say is don't rely on any one indicator too heavily, okay? You want to see confluence with price action, confluence with level maybe perhaps other indicators. Or like Neil says, you know, if it bounces off that particular level, get it on the back end. And by back end, I mean, you know, if it's retracing down into a support level, say the lower band of the Bollinger Band, wait till it starts curling back up, proving to you that that is a support level that it is respecting. So unless you're gonna get in with a tight stop and, you know, do that dance where you get stopped out, you get back in, you get stopped out, for small L's until you take that big W, that's not my style. I'd rather wait for confirmation. So if you're gonna use Bollinger Bands, use them with something else, all right, as um, a confirmatory, uh, another confirmatory indicator, or get it on the back end. That's what I would say to that, okay? Moving down. Um, anything else here? John, Del Segno, Etsy about to break tops on the day yeah, and has room to run. Yeah, Etsy's, uh, Etsy got, uh, Who's talking about Etsy the other day? Was it somebody on CNBC? Etsy's a beast right now. I only, all, this is one that I always forget on the NQ for you some reason. want to have a look at Etsy? Yeah, I pulled it up when I first saw that mentioned in the chat. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, look at this. Um, we are about to make a double top here. I, I think if we break above this double top, we're up like 3.76% on the day. Very much not a bad look, John. Del Segno. And if you, anyone here is kind of long from like these earlier, um, this like 70... Six two seventy six six area, I would say that is a beautiful look. Um, so yeah, I mean, if we break above the seventy eight two area, this could be of interest. Um, also interesting too. Again, an example of how not all um, stocks are respecting all indicators at all times. Earlier today, VWAP, uh, VWAP was kind of an interesting area for Etsy. We had that break above VWAP, couldn't really hold it, went back down again, and then we had this decisive break upwards. Right. So now I would say Etsy and VWAP are not in the same sentence. Um, but earlier they would be, right? Also, um, I kind of, speaking of kind of double top related actions, I do want to address the short I'm in, that I've been in for a moment now. Um, this is this Eli Lilly short. So yes, I realized we had a bit of a failed attempt at an Eli Lilly short earlier today. I am not going to um, deny that that occurred. But now I think like what I waited for too is I waited for a red candle. I noticed this double top failure of this 593.5, these failed wicks to the upside. I was like, you know what? We're gonna do this. If we break above this 395.5, bye bye, Eli Lilly, au revoir, um, adio, adios. Um, but yeah, so I mean, I like this short right now, though. We're kind of slowly stutter stepping to the downside. Um, no complaints here. And we're not super strong on the day either. We're like, we're, we're kind of going negative right now. But yeah, I think that, you know, part of too, I, I talk about like trading psychology a lot as something that kind of has stopped me. And especially because I had some, you know, questionable trades earlier, this Eli Lilly trade, my meta trade earlier. I think part of it too is like we were saying, if you know, like about conviction and courage, if you notice um, a trend, sometimes don't be afraid to kind of jump in, right? Like I noticed this kind of movement to the downside in Eli Lilly. I got in this short. Sometimes you have to, I hate that I'm quoting Taylor Swift, but you have to <laughs> shake it off when you have a loss. 
<laughs> and you have to keep going. And so that's what I did with this Eli Lilly short. And right now it's been successful. So, so you really do have to, to trust your convictions. You're, you're trading really well today, eh? Look Thank you. you. I you mean, had we had some questionable. Tesla. Meta was kind of questionable. Um, and then my earlier Eli Lilly short was questionable. But I thank like you. how you're short right too. Like before we even got on the, sh on the show, she said to me off camera, she's like, I really like shorting now, right? Like, I'm, yeah. I'm into shorting because you know that there's like long bias, short bias trading. Yeah, right? I think you I know. might be more short bias well, today. I've only taken shorts. You're one of those people that wants the world to burn, don't aren't Apparently. You? <laughs> also, kidding. so um, Lolo in the chat, Adara loves some Eli Lilly, LOL. Yeah, I mean, I, I like like this one and, uh, and Netflix. I like that they move kind of a little bit slower, so they take a while to get going. But when they get going, you can just eat up the profits. Sometimes, sometimes. So yeah, so I kind of enjoy uh, Michelle Meir. Lily is tricky to trade without a catalyst. Yeah, I agree. Like this is purely a technical trade. Like if we're talking technical versus fundamental, this is purely technical. Um, but you know what? Like I, I'm kind of liking the level so far. I may regret it, but right now I'm kind of happy with how we're going. Question here from the path. The path to you. What are your thoughts about using the combination of the person's market person's market uh, catcher, PMC, and MACD. I've never even heard of PMC till you mentioned it. I had to actually Google it. Um, I know we talked about MACD yesterday. If you want to have a look at the, uh, the talk that we had about Lesson. MACD, uh, just have a look at yesterday's show. You can go back, obviously, on YouTube and watch any of our previous live broadcasts. I can't opine on that because I've never used PMC. It looks like it's available on Thinkorswim. It looks like they're saying it's a variation of the RSI, the Relative Strength Index. And that's what we talked about, MACD, about the, the you know, similarities between RSI and MACD. Personally, just to review yesterday's lesson, RSI I don't use as you know, an indicator when to buy or sell in overbought or oversold positions above 70, over, uh, overbought, below, set, below 30, oversold. That's not how I use it. I look for divergence between the highs being made on relative strength index and the highs being made or the lows, whatever the trend is, being made on the price action. For example, if the price action, the price chart continues to make higher highs, but the relative strength indi in, uh, index has a lower high, that is a divergence, and that's what I'm looking for. Same thing with the moving average convergence divergence. What I'm looking for there are troughs or, or crests that are lower or higher than the price action. I'm looking for divergence between those two, in, uh, between the uh, MACD or the RSI and the, and the price level, okay? By the way, here we go again on GME, 17 coming in. We have a 1710, 1711-ish high. Uh, we retraced right back down into that 16 and a half, and here we go again, a lot of buying. So shout out to anybody who didn't hit the flatten key like a, like a dummy, like I did on the GME trade. It is continuing to run great trade for um, the, uh, you know, the meme, the meme people. People love this stuff. People like AMC, they love GME. Who remembers costs? Who remembers uh, Blackberry when it squeezed? Even, oh, we were talking about this yesterday, Playboy was one of those uh, meme stocks as well. It had its uh, moment in the sun around that time. So, yeah, all right, now let's, uh, let's go on to Fibs. Okay, let's go on to Fibs for a second time. You wanna, get, you wanna touch on this? Let's do it. Okay. Um, let me pull up my notes here, just a moment. Okay, beautiful. Um, what is the Fibonacci sequence? Um, so it's it was developed by the Italian mathematician Leonardo Fibonacci in the 13th century. So this is something you can not just use in trading, but also other elements. Someone was saying in the chat earlier, and I, I'm familiar with this as well, that there is like people say there's Fibonacci sequences in nature. It's kind of a recurring sequence, but basically it's a sequence of numbers starting with zero and one, steadily increasing, where each number is equal to the sum of its two previous numbers. So some traders believe that the Fibonacci Show an example. <laughs> Fibonacci series and Show me an uh, example yeah, of for that. sure. Yeah. So I'll pull this up here and we'll kind of full screen it. Um, so basically, um, it's like each number is equal to the sum of the pr previous two numbers. So zero plus one is one, one plus one is two, <laughs> one plus two is three, two plus three is five. <laughs> no, what you show, like, okay, so the previous one, Sorry, number. one plus one. So start at like three. Okay, So right. three is there because one plus two, two is, is three. three. Five is there. Here because three plus two is five. And then we have um, eight, which is there because three plus five is eight. 
13, 5 plus 8, et cetera, et cetera, right? So you can kind of add the two previous numbers to get the new number. Um, is someone, is it the same as, Fib as, the, as the golden ratio? I believe that the Fibonacci and the golden ratio are the same, um, but do not quote me on that. Um, yeah, so how do you use the Fibonacci sequence now that we kind of know what it is? Very mathematical. Um, so it can be applied to finance by using four techniques, including retracements, arcs, fans, and time zones. Yep. Um, so Fibonacci retracements require two price points um, that are chosen on a chart, usually a swing high and a swing low. So once those points are chosen, the Fibonacci numbers and lines are drawn as percentages of that move, or at percentages of that move, sorry. So if a stock rises from 15 to 20, then the 23.6% level is 18 point, uh, or $18.82. So it'd be $20 um, minus the $5 price point multiplied by that percentage. So it's yep. a little bit of math. Um, and then you would kind of get the 50% level by doing you know, the same thing, 50, and then you'd uh, do minus that price point times the percentage that you want. Okay. So lots of math. I want to get into Fibonacci fans because this is one that I didn't cover. We talked about how to use the Fibonacci lines and the retracements. You draw it from on a long position. You draw it from the low to the high, okay? And then you have different percentage retracements that you can get. The fans, entirely different. What you're doing here is you're finding a critical area for a long, it would be, a crit, uh, example, the bottom end of a trough, okay? And then you're drawing the fib lines off that bottom, all right? In this case, you have this, uh, you have the, um, the 38.2 over here, the 61, and then the hundreds up here, okay? And then what you're doing is you're drawing trend lines to the different levels on the fib. And what these are supposed to do is they're supposed to actually be possible areas of support or resistance, depending on which way you're drawing it. So you, dr you draw, sorry, you start the fib from the, uh, the trough, you draw it to the high, and then you take horizontal lines from that same trough that you started the fib from, and then you're drawing it to the lines. And then the intersecting points between the diagonal trend lines and the horizontal fib lines, that becomes your level of either resistance or support, and that's how you use the fans, okay? And so this is a very interesting way. I've used it on the daily chart uh, before, uh, especially on the indexes, like the NDX or the SPX. I haven't used it intraday. I don't know what its, uh, you know, its utility is. I don't wanna say that it's not useful, it's obviously something that's gonna take a little bit more time to do, and intraday trading requires you to be a bit quicker. In any event, uh, this is what we talk about by fans, and it, it kind of looks like a fan, like one of those handheld fans that you fan yourself with. Yeah, so that's what that's all that's about. Cool. So the retracements are like what Adara talked about. That's the kind of the, the run of the mill way to use it. Let me just show you retracements here real quick, super easy. Let's uh, take, for example, GME. Yes, today's uh, low, we'll draw the FIB. These are the FIB retracements, okay? So we take it from the low, we draw it to the high. Let me actually restart that, I'm gonna use the wicks. Okay, let's go like that. From the low over here to the high of the wick. And then what you're looking for are retracements into these levels. Now people ask, well, how do you know uh, what to do when it comes into a certain level? Well wait for it, let's see what it does at that particular level. Does it respect it, yes or no? If it does, get it on the back end when it starts retracing. This is the simple way to use FIB. The other way are the fans, and this is two of four ways, is to basically go like this. So this is where I've created my uh, little, this is the starting spot for my FIB, this bottom trough over here. Then what I would do is draw lines like this, okay? And that would be the intersecting point over here between the 23%. This would be an area of support. And another one would be, it's just harder to draw on this. There we go. Like that. Oh, that's cool to see it yeah. on the chart. Exactly. Uh, it's not something that I use, to be quite honest with you, but uh, it's something that we have to explain to you because this is, uh, you know, this is part of using Fibonacci's. Patrick, Sharif, I feel like fibs don't work if they're if it 
if it never retraces. That, well, I mean, if you're using it for a retracement purpose, then yeah, it may not work because then it doesn't retrace. I gotta tell you, I don't use fibs intraday, uh, not even with small cap gappers. I like fibs on the daily chart. Uh, especially for swing trades. I, I've said that about many different indicators. That doesn't mean it's not usable intraday. I'm not saying that at all. I personally don't use it intraday, okay? Quickly here, GME has rejected off 17 again. 17 presenting itself as a clear resistance level in the same way that 16 did earlier on. So the whole dollar levels coming into play today on GME very clearly. We've had three rejections so far, so far on GME at $17, uh, but we haven't made a lower low. That is very important. Look at this trough over here at that 1640. We haven't made a lower low below that, so the trade to the long side, in my opinion, is still valid until a lower low comes into play. That's a good point, yeah, because we are still having higher yeah. lows. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so you want to continue? Yeah, let's with, continue uh, with Fibs? Yeah. Fibonacci's. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, they can kind of use to be, be used to basically uh, demonstrate a pro pullback, try to figure out where the pro back, pullback may be. Um, and they're usually kind of, traders usually will watch between like 23.6%, 78.6% tw during these times. If the price stalls near a Fibonacci level and then starts to move back in the trading direction, an investor could trade in that trading direction. But there is some, you know, like it's kind of difficult as we were saying earlier because you have to chart them correctly and then that's kind of where the issue comes in. Like if you if you chart them well, then you could have success. But if you don't chart it correctly, if you chart starting at the wrong point, we were kind of saying earlier, then you could kind of end up in a situation where you've charted it wrong, you've cal calculated the pullback incorrectly, and then you end up setting your profit takers or your stops in an inappropriate way, and it can kind of um, mess with the, tra uh, with the trade, right? So I think it is something that can be effective if you are using them <coughs> properly, um, from my understanding anyway. They're not something I use, truthfully. It's something that I, I'm trying to work more indicators into my trading diet, um, so I'm not Honestly, it's not something that I use, the Fibonacci. Um, but yeah, basically, um, the different kind of Fibonacci elements, so the, the fans and the time zones, uh, they're similar concepts, but they're applied to charts in different ways. So each kind of Fibonacci-related concept can show potential areas of support or resistance based on Fibonacci numbers applied to prior price moves. So these supportive or resistance levels can be used to forecast where prices can fall or rise in the future. But again, a lot of it comes with, like, you know, having the calculations correct. Um, but yeah, that is the Fibonacci take. Man, Ram Ram just posted the little, uh, uh, you know, uh, segment between the Katina man, myself, and the Neil this morning when he was uh, accusing me of thirst trapping. Uh, like, come on, man. Is this posted? Yeah, he posted it. Ram Ram uh, did it. She's always responsible for the nefarious things that happen nefarious. around here. <laughs> How <was> pretty responsible. <laughs> Shout out to Ram Ram. Oh my God. I like Sean taking the culpability there too. <laughs> I'm down there, Gnar Whale. Stop calling her that. Um, yeah, Gnar Whale. Oh, I just realized what that was. It took me yeah. way too long to get that. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I know. We're not calling her that, by the way. Um, but <laughs> that's hilarious. It took me way too long to get that. No, I'm laughing at Ram Ram. Oh, that was really funny. Yeah. All right, rejection <laughs> off 17 here on GME. Looks, uh, it's happening. Again, guys, uh, look for the lower low. I, I say the trade possibly still valid to the north side until you get that <clears throat> trough break. And the trough break, break is clearly at that $16.40 level. And we haven't got there. We're still at 16 mid-60s right there. Uh, Maxi Jr., bring Ram Ram on camera to defend herself. Yeah, Ram Ram, put the <laughs> camera on yourself. Come on. <laughs> she won't do it. You know, the Chilean nightmare is there. Maybe I should uh, conspire with him to have Ram Ram on camera. Conspire? <laughs> yeah, we're having a good time over here. All right, guys, any questions about fibs? Whether using the retracement method or the fan method, uh, put it in the chat. And uh, we will uh, love to uh, answer your questions to the best of our ability. Um, Brandon, do you ever use the 15-minute chart with your 45-day SMA for a support bounce? So I don't use the 45-day SMA. I don't even use simple moving averages. Uh, intraday for day trading, I'm using exponential moving averages. Uh, and I love the 15-minute chart, but there is uh, no, <clears throat> no connection between 
between the 45 SMA and the 15 minute chart for me. I, that's the first I'm hearing of it. It sounds like, you know, that's something that you do, not discounting at all, Brendan. Um, but uh, I, I don't have any comment on that because it's not something that I've utilized myself. Moving down. Um, ba -ba -ba. Brandon, sorry, James. Adara, Adara Dare? Yeah, okay. All right, take it into consideration. <laughs> All right, uh, Cameron McComb. Could you explain possible trend continuation levels when using FIBs for long-term swings? For example, if a stock bounces off a specific percentage level, is it more likely to continue? That's a great question. And so what you're looking for is confluence between the, the FIB level and the price action. If the price action is showing you that it held that, look for example, so say we draw FIBs and it's, at, it's bouncing off a level, say the 50% level on the FIB, and there's no other actual price action around there to justify why it could be bouncing off that 50% level, like a closing print, um, a very specific uh, support level on the daily chart or any, like on the hourly chart, but it seems to be bouncing off that level, then it should give you a hint that, you know, it's bouncing off that level because it's respecting that 50% FIB level. Now, it's always better to have other reasons why it's bouncing there because then you have conflicts. You have multiple reasons, multiple indicators pointing you into that direction. So will it continue? It should. I mean, if it bounces, it's not a hard and fast rule. You know, with trading, it, again, technical analysis is more of an art than a science. So, you know, anything could come um, subsequent to that bounce and cause it to go down like a bad headline. For example, uh, one of the Fed speakers says something that the market doesn't like. So it's not a guarantee, obviously, that it's going to run, but it makes it more likely than not, especially if it's holding on to that level. Um, again, I don't personally use FIBs intraday. FIBs for me are for swing trading and for more general market analysis uh, on the indexes, etc., like that. That's just the way I use it. Doesn't mean that's the only way to use it, okay? Um, moving down, let's see what the other questions are. Sorry. Acrylic, thoughts on the golden pocket? I don't even know what that is. I have no idea what the golden pocket look up is. The golden pocket. Yeah, um, sure. Let me uh, move and down. And then we can have thoughts on it. If Bob Curran says women make great traders. I would have to agree with that. He's obviously talking to you. Thank you. With respect to that, thank yeah, I much. think. I mean, we're, we're, I'm trying to get there, right? Still very early in the trading journey, but thank you. and. Thank you for the bang to whoever. Well, it's is. obviously Ramin. She's obviously very excited back there. <laughs> um, <laughs> woman power. Um, any other questions? D Loaf. What's up, D? Quick, qu quick visual representation of the FIP fan for those who missed it. Yes, no problem. Here it is. Yeah, it looks really cool when you actually physically see it. Okay, so apparently the, the golden pocket is part of the Fibonacci. It's like the oh, golden ratio. Yeah, no, kind of I, I don't. Yeah. I don't. I don't use that to be honest with you. So that I don't have any familiar. comment on that. Um, but there it is. This is the uh, the fan. Basically, what you're doing is you're drawing horizontal trend lines, right, through the different fib levels, and then the intersection point between those is supposed to be an area of support for stocks that are trending up or conversely if it's uh it's a downtrend resist uh support sorry uh resistance levels for stocks that are trending down so that's uh that's what the visual representation of a fit fan is i've used them before but again on the daily not on uh not intraday lincoln i always found that th the 38 percent retracement has a 38 percent probability to break the highs 50 percent retracement potential sideways move etc Okay, that's a good data point. If you have data to support that, I personally don't know uh, whether that's accurate or not. What were you saying, Katina Man? Like we just... And what happened? So it, it just dropped a dollar in one minute. The, the Katina Man reloaded Tesla at that 248 level, and it just, or 248.50, excuse me. Oh. Yes, okay, I'm, I'm looking, I'm looking. Um, because there could be a bond auction that I'm... Un I keep forgetting to do the housekeeping, I guys. I should not have gotten involved in it. Uh, no, sure. we don't have a bond auction today, thankfully. Woo. We did have nat gas storage at 1030. Still didn't get that. Uh, we have uh, Fed Mester speaking at 145. Loretta Mester, uh, Fed 
I think she's a San Francisco Fed president, or is that Mary Daly? Not Mary. Da yeah, Mary Daly. Uh, I, I don't remember where Mester is from. And then we have the beige book at two o'clock. So those are the only two um, bookkeep or sorry, housekeeping things that we need to uh, concern ourselves with today. One forty-five. Fed uh, Loretta Mester speaks at. I don't know where she's going to be on. And then two o'clock the beige book. All right, moving down. Uh, the questions here. One moment, just a look over here. The Boring Man Beige Book, yeah, I saw the Beige Book. He moves markets, says Roger. Yeah, well, today we, uh, we obviously had a lot of Fed speakers yesterday as well. Uh, we'll have to wait and see what we get, um, but uh, it's been an interesting week, no question about that. Yeah, such, a, such an interesting week. Yeah. 16.1, again, here on the Fuge. Uh, we need to point this out because we just touched 16.1 right now. And 16.1 uh, is an obvious resistance level because it was previously support earlier in the morning. This is the level I'm talking about. Um, resistance becomes support. Support becomes resistance. We talked about that when we talked about um, uh, managing uh, risk on the first week. In case you guys want to go back to any of the lessons that we had, just go into our YouTube page. Probably really easy to show you. Um, go into the YouTube page right here. And then what you do is you go to live, this one over here, and then all our live broadcasts will be there. And then Adara and I are in the pink uh, thumbnail, and then the big kahunas have the blue one. So very Oh, I didn't, that, that's not the color. I, how did I mm -hmm. never notice that? Yeah, that makes yeah. Sense? Right? Yeah, so that's, uh, that's how you get to that. And then you can go back to, uh, and then they're all, they're all tagged. Like, look at that, indicators part two, yeah. indicators part three, uh, et cetera. Chart and I patterns. like the little like blackboard. Yeah, right? like it's all, it, it's there. Yeah, it's all there, guys. Um, all right. Uh, you want to continue with uh, the fib before we uh, restart with uh, VWAP? Yeah, um, let's see what else is going on with the, the fib. Yeah, so basically, um, some people, I'm seeing some questions about um, extensions, fib extensions, which I'm not. Honestly, I'm not, like I said, I'm not super familiar with FIB, but I saw some questions about yeah. how to draw the extensions. Um, yeah, that in general, with the, the Fibonacci's, yeah, it's the most common form of, Fibonacci retracements are the most common form of technical analysis that is based on the Fibonacci sequences. So basically, using um, Fibonacci retracements can be used to determine the, the depth of a pullback. But yeah, kind of like I was saying earlier too, like Sharif was kind of pointing out, if you do, um, like, you know, math it out incorrectly, for lack of a better term, uh, you could have a bit of a sticky situation where you've kind of uh, now incorrectly assessed where you will put your profit takers and your stops. Um, but yeah, basically, um, each Fibonacci air aspect is slightly different. There's a lot, you know, clearly to learn here. I'll go, I'll look into the golden pocket here too, because I know some people were saying the golden pocket with regards to Fibonacci. So that is um, basically, the golden pocket is the Fibonacci level uh, that indicates a complete reversal and a possi possible positive price retracement. So yeah, same kind of, I guess, general idea with the, the Fibonacci in general, right? Like that's the specific area that represents um, positive price retracement. Perhaps here, um, oh, so it's more of a crypto thing here I'm saying too, I'm seeing the Fibonacci mm. with the golden pocket. I was not aware that Fibonacci was uh, really popular in the crypto community. Look yeah, I mean, I've, I've heard anecdotally that, uh, you know, crypto trades more uh, technically based. Oh, that and, makes sense. Yeah. yeah. But again, I've never traded crypto, nor have I ever bought crypto. So I'm, all that's just more uh, anecdotal to me. Uh, Vin Duong, um, how do you read multiple candles with long wicks on both ends, but a small body? Yeah, those are candles of indecision. Okay. And we're going to get to candlestick patterns in, a ne in the upcoming weeks. But when you have a long upper wick and a long lower wick and a small body, it is a candle of indecision. And the market is basically telling you, I don't know what to do, <laughs> right? Or the equity or the instrument um, that you're trading. So that is a candle of indecision. I'm, how you interpret it, I'm assuming, will have to be about how the price action uh, manifests subsequent to that. Um, you know, there are ones that even though they have a long lower wick and a long upper wick, the, the lower wick will be much longer than the upper wick. In that case, if the body closes nearer the upper wick, that is likely a, a reversal candle because what happened was the price really dipped down 
and the buyer said, no, no you don't, and they brought it right back up, and then look to the subsequent candle, does it make a new high above the upper wick of that candle? So what you're looking for there is how the market, you know, manifests after that candle of indecision, but that is a candle of indecision. Bless you. Bless you. Um, what's going on there, Katina, man? Dollar, hit it. There it is. What are you, a Tesla? The Katina Man is short Tesla, and it's a bit, a bit of a print factory over there off that 248 and a half reload as he comes back down into 247 and a half. Money, money, money. Yeah, Tesla not doing well today, nor is the dead one, uh, uh, otherwise known as Apple. Thank you for calling it the dead one. Yeah, I don't understand. Did you see uh, Apple sell off in the aftermarket yesterday after, no. uh, God rest his soul, uh, Charlie Munger passed away? That's a really strange. Because I, mean, I guess people, because I guess the BRK relationship Berkshire. with Apple is like yeah, kind of it's iconic. their biggest yeah. holding. He doesn't run the company, people. Why are you selling? Right, but it's probably the algos. But Apple's been very weak today. Look at all these lower highs and lower lows. Look at that. Yeah. That well, is what you call it's a It's living up pattern. to its name, the dead one. It is. Well, I mean, it's moving at least, right? I mean, yeah, that's true. Like, I guess when it's more dead, it is, it, it's just kind of flat. Yeah. But yeah, no, I think, I know you just called it that the one day, but I think Apple will always be anything. the dead one in my heart now. <laughs> all right, guys, rejection off 16.1 on the future right now. So coming back down. Uh, Meg seven names. Keep uh, keep an eye out for those for possible shorts as we did reject 16-1 again. Um, all right, uh, let's restart with VWAP here. Uh, any other questions, guys? Before we move into VWAP about fibs, um, despite the fact I got, I got to tell you the truth, I don't use them all that often, so my knowledge of them will be you know decent at best. But uh, any other questions that you have, uh, put them in the chat now before we move on. Uh, Vin Duong says, thank you, sir. It's snowing up in Canada. And we had like uh, a little, look, I live in a condo, so my car never gets snowed on. But what I saw was there's a fire station in front of me and they have some cars parked there. They had like a tiny layer of snow. I'm sure it's already melted by now because we have a uh, four degree high today, Celsius, not Fahrenheit. Um, very yeah, exactly. Um, all right, let's see. Uh, any other questions, guys, with fibs? I use fib arcs, lessons would cost you. Okay, huh. it says four Atlas. Mm -hmm. All right, let's start with VWAP again. Let me load up my notes. What's going on with Tesla? Another dollar winner? Right, two. Oh. The Katina man is now $2 in the money on Tesla. That's beautiful. Ish, $2 ish in the money. One, a dollar 78 ish. All right, we're I like the specificity, detailed. yeah. yeah we're, we're, being, we're being specific. Too sharp. What happens when there is confluence um, of VWAP and an important FIB retracement, which is given more important? Look, anytime there's confluence between two indicators, it's better. It's what, stronger. Yeah. yeah. What you're looking for, like when we talked about when we talked about chart patterns, and you know, we said ascending wedges, right? We get constantly higher lows with a flat top. So you have, you know. Um, that ascending wedge, sort of that uh, ascending triangle. What happens when you get the break of that flat top on higher than normal volume? That's basically a confirmatory indicator. Volume is one indicator as well, so is the chart pattern. So it's always great when more than one indicator points to a specific level for a specific reason. So I gotta agree with you. When there is more than one indicator that you're looking at that's really pointing at that level, the better. Magic Mike, NQ wicked real quick, wicked real quick on volume. How do you see that one? How do you see that just noise or what? How do you see that just noise or the short is over? Well, you knew that 16.1 was going to be an important level, right? Because we traded at 16.1 as a support level, and then we gave up the ghost at 16.1 after multiple attempts. So right away, 16.1 on your radar. So when you come up into 16.1, you're already alert. So you're looking at what it's doing. And look what it did. Come to the chart, Raymond. Look at this. Comes into 16.1, immediately rejects. So you, you knew already, you were aware that 16.1 was going to be a thing, and it was. And it was multiple times. The 100-point levels on the futures have been very important today, whether 200 or 100, okay? And today's closing print, sorry, yesterday's closing print was also very important. 
because we bounced off that to the downside, which was around over here somewhere. I don't get the closing prints on PPROA charts, but I got them on my other one. So what you're, you know, it shouldn't have been like a, a shock to you that we rejected off 16.1. Now, you didn't have much of an opportunity to watch it trade. You would have had to have been quick on the trigger, so to speak, here, because it touched 16.099, and then the big boy Hwadunk came in, and then you retraced 25 points south. So, you know, whether or not you waited for confirmation that 16.1 was going to be another resistance level, if you did, you likely gave up some profits here. Yeah. Um, just looking at some of the... Uh, no way. Hog Rider says, man, you up two goals? Are you kidding? Oh, my God. Let me have a look here. Yeah. Uh, Arsenal doesn't play till later. Man, you obviously being a small club, they play earlier. <laughs> that was such an insult. <laughs> I, like, I was like, of course you I'm didn't. kidding. I'm, guys, I'm just joking here, right? Yeah. Uh, they're beating up Galatasaray, which is a Turkish club, 2 nilski on Galatasaray's uh, land, 29 minutes deep. Sevilla and PSV, which is Arsenal's group, um, they're uh, Sevilla winning a one Nilski against uh, PSV Eindhoven in the 29th minute as well. Great games today, guys. Real Madrid, Napoli. That's a that's a barn burner right there. I'm going to be probably uh, split screening that bad oh boy. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. With Arsenal, obviously Arsenal plays Lons. Uh Yeah, uh, Real Madrid, Napoli. Great game. Benfica and Inter could be good. Uh, uh, Bayern Munich is going to kill Copenhagen. Uh, Harry Kane has just been outrageous this year since his move from the Prem into the Bundesliga. You're done? You're out of that? What are you clapping for? You're printing, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. The Katina Man is continuing to print on that Tesla short. For anybody following along with the Katina Man there, short 48 and a half, uh, 248 and a half, pardon me, on TSLA as the Fuge continues to reject 16-1 Adair. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm happy the future is continuing to reject 16-1. As someone who's in an NVIDIA short, um, we're about... Oh, what is that? That's a Cybertruck <gasps> countdown. Ooh. I'm, I'm very excited for the Cybertruck trading Tesla <laughs> tomorrow. I don't know if it'll go up. I don't know if it'll go down. I don't know if I'll lose three fake paper dollars in the money like I did win the Meta Connect event. <laughs> but we're going to keep an eye out. Do you remember that? Do... That was a disaster. That was painful. Yeah. I, that was one of my first. It was definitely my first 10 days of trading somewhere in there. And I wanted to get in because it was like a mad a madhouse over yeah, there. Yeah, it Meta. was. And it was, um, it was intense, and it was live in front of everybody here, too. So it was, I mean, thank God it was, like, you know, simulation could have been worse. But, no, very entertaining. I think it taught me a lot about how quickly the market can move and how you should never assume how the market's going to react to something because it will tell you. Oh, yeah. It does not care about your feelings. It does not and care. And it does not matter what level you were looking at with Meta. Mm -hmm. Like, no technical event could have prepared you for the madness that was the Meta Connect sell-off. Oh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I will be very hesitant. Okay, uh, GME just broke. Uh, GME's high at days now, guys. It just printed 1720. Big move up on GME. What do we say? The Katina Man's printed on that one as well. But what do we say about this one? If this broke the lower, the, this low over here, the trade was no longer valid. But we don't get the break of that low. It makes a higher low. And now we have a higher high. Trend following systems work. There we go. Okay. Yeah, you were right because we, we had the, it was with lower highs. Yeah, because you said it's higher low. Weird. Higher low, so you that's mean. What I yeah. Mean. I always, I always yeah. do that. <laughs> but yeah, because you said as long as it doesn't make a lower low, it's still a long. Look at that. Trade Guru. I like the I name. I love the name. Yeah. Can you please talk or have a separate session about your stock selection process in the morning? Oh, oh very nice. I okay. like that. Yes, that's a very good one. Thank you for that. Um, I personally use two sources. My watch list on the side that I've compiled over the years and my scanner. We're going to get to the scanner one. I think that's really important, especially for the people that want to trade the small cap gappers. Uh, the small cap gappers will likely show up on the scanners. You probably don't have wind of them on your watch list because they're kind of innocuous and nobody really knows about them um, until they run up 300% like VVOS is today. Um, we'll talk about that. Thank you for that, Trade Guru. Uh, I really great like that suggestion video. there. It's kind of funky. Yeah, Tushar, has someone told you you resemble Roger Federer? I don't know. I've never been told that, and I don't think I do. But, also, uh, did you see Ramin's, um, I'm assuming this is Ramin in the chat here, uh, morning squats and socks luxury. 
Bro, you're killing me. Um, ram, ram. Morning squats and stocks. Yeah, that'd be great. Brendo's been the one hitting the gym in the morning. Yeah. Yeah, we, I work know. out in the morning just at my house before I come here. Good yeah, I work you. out every morning before, you, really? I, before I get you here. You never yeah. mentioned that. Well, yeah, I work out daily, but I get like super tired um, in the afternoon. So it's like, and I, you know, I always prefer working out in the morning anyway. So it just works out, get up a little Good earlier. Good for you. Work out at home. I walk to work. I walk back from work. So yeah. Good Good I feel like the morning, it kind of wakes you up a little bit. I'd know? love to be able to do yeah. that, but uh, I, you know, I get up, what time? I get up 545. Yeah, that's fair. And I would, if I had to get up like probably four to get in a workout. Yeah, see, I do. Right? I, I don't want to do that. I do like um, some stuff when I get home too, but I like to do like my, my general, like the main stuff I want to do in the morning mm. just because I'm more alert. And to be honest with you, I'd like it better because every time I go to the gym after work, it's packed and it's all high school kids. Yeah. And it drives I me know, nuts. right? That's why. That's why. Drives also, I like. Nuts. I'd rather like work out at home and avoid the teenagers. You know what I mean? I mean why do they come in like twenty deep? And then, yeah, they come in twenty of them, and then they just congregate. Yeah. They do not use the equipment. They congregate around yes. the equipment. Uh, I'm sorry for the rant there, but <laughs> if, if you've been there, it's pretty upsetting. You, you would know. Build back better says Sharif found a new workout buddy. She works out at home, so I uh, can't do that. I work out sometimes in the gym on the weekends, but I there usually work out at home because it's like too early for the gym at that point. <laughs> All right, we're uh, we're di uh, we're, we're di uh, digressing or Very whatever so. um, over here. Okay, let's get back to the topic, guys. VWAP. Let's start uh, Ram Ram. If we yeah, we're actually on VWAP. Perfect. All right, guys. Let me bring in my chart with the volume weighted average price over here. We're gonna look at GME because GME is an absolute rocket ship today. Let me just get rid of these indicators, move all trend lines, there we go. Volume weighted average price. What is the volume weighted average price? It is a measurement that shows the average price of a security adjusted for its volume. Simple calculation, guys. It's calculated during a specific trading session by taking the total dollar value of trading in a security or an instrument and dividing it by the total volume of trades. Simple. The formula for calculating VWAP is cumulative. So, one thing you should know about this is that VWAP, unless used differently, resets every day. So, when you have VWAP here, like this is a perfect example. No, 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 come here. Look at this. The white line is VWAP on my chart. Look where VWAP is. This, this line over here, this dotted line, can they see this dotted line? Let me actually put in a, a horizontal trend line, vertical trend line, sorry. So this vertical trend line over here is the separation of the day's trading. This candle over here is the 8 p.m. candle from yesterday. And this candle over here is the 4 a.m. candle from this morning, okay? So even though the price continues naturally, like where we closed off at 8 p.m. yesterday was at $15, and then where we opened up this morning was $15.22. Look at the difference between where VWAP is on both of these candles. Yeah. VWAP on both these days. VWAP closed out the day at 3 p uh, 8 p.m. yesterday at 13 and a quarter. Yet this morning, it opened up at that 15 and a half area. So VWAP resets every day unless you are using the anchored VWAP system, in which case you are instructing the computer to start VWAP at a certain time on a certain day. That's not how it typically is by default. It resets daily. Want to make that point yeah. clear? Moving on. Why is the volume weighted average price important? Very good. Why the hell are we using it? VWAP gives traders a smoothed out indication of a securities price adjusted for volume, of course, over time. It's used by institutional traders to ensure that their trades do not move the price of the security that they are trying to buy or sell too extremely. And this is the example that I gave earlier. Say right now, perfect example, General Motors. They come out today, they're like, oh, we're gonna buy back all these shares, good for us, we're gonna use money we shouldn't be using. Kidding, of course. Um, <laughs> all of a sudden, big money, Hedge funds, sovereign wealth funds, pension funds, and the like get wind of that. They like that new look, and they want to get in on General Motors. Let's pull up the General Motors chart. Ram Ram, come to the chart. So, you have a big move up today on GM because of the share back, buyback, as well as some other, as, as well as some other reasons. Now, all of a sudden, 
we are above VWAP for the majority of the day. So what the big money traders or yeah, big money traders, they don't want to do is they don't want to artificially inflate the price of the stock and they don't want to tip their hand to what other to to their other competitors that they're buying this up. So what they do is they wait for the price to come into VWAP or below VWAP and then buy it up if they're looking to buy it. The opposite is true for shorting. They also are judged by their bosses like um, managing directors uh, in hedge funds. I always, I follow these uh, meme accounts about um, investment banking. They always make fun of these managing directors for some reason. That's really they're gonna, specific. Yeah, I know. They're gonna be judged by the price that they get for the particular security that they're instructed to buy. And the basis, the standard upon which you're gonna be judged is what was the volume weighted average price for that day? And what was your average price that you were able to buy the security at? Was it above the closing print for VWAP or was it below? If it's below and you were instructed to go long, you'll get bonus points, right? So you'll have gotten a better price than what the typical price was on that day. So that's why it's important. It's used by institutional trading and that's what I care about. Now, from a retail perspective, it can kind of be a group fulfilling prophecy because we're kind of all looking at VWAP. We all have respect for VWAP. We have VWAP on our charts. And, you know, some of us, you know, we want to use VWAP as like um, a support level or a resistance level uh, for the shorts. So a lot of people looking at that indicator helps make, helps makes, make it relevant, makes it relevant. That's the other part that I want to say. Now, how is VWAP used? VWAP is used in different ways by different traders. Traders may use VWAP as a trend confirmation tool and building trades, building trading rules around it. For instance, they may consider stocks with prices below VWAP as undervalued and those above it as overvalued. If prices below VWAP move above it, traders may go long on the stock. If price if prices above VWAP move below it, they may sell their positions or initiate short positions. That's one way to use it. Personally, what I use it for is as an area of support and resistance. And I use it differently depending upon the instrument that I'm trading. For small caps, I will not go long a small cap gapper if the price is below VWAP. That's not what I do, okay? That's not necessarily true for the mega cap names. Despite the fact that I do respect VWAP as a support or resistance level, it will not prevent me from going long a large cap name if the price action is below VWAP. To me, it's more important uh, that the price action levels that have earmarked, whether the closing print, the low of day, whatever, the re whatever price action support level that I've earmarked there, that's the one that I'm more concerned with rather than, you know, being weary about going long a stock that has a price below view up on a large cap. That, that's not how I use it there. But small caps, you're not gonna see me taking a long below view up. Institutional buyers, including mutual funds, use VWAP to help move into or out of stocks with as small of a market impact as possible. They're not, they're, again, they're trying not to tip their hand to the market. They don't want you to know what they're doing. They wanna like dip their toe in and dip out. Yeah, there you go. Therefore, when they can, institutions will try to buy below the VWAP or sell above it. This way, their actions push the price back towards the average instead of away from it, all right? There are lines in Sharif's shirts that are Fibonacci sequence, says Darwin. Darwin, bro, you kill me, man. You are the OG. Darwin's hilarious, man. He makes me laugh all the time. All right, limitations of VWAP. VWAP, like I mentioned at the top, is a single day indicator and it restarts at the open of each new trading day. Now, the point I wanted to make is it restarts differently depending on the platform that you use. And we gave this example earlier. On our PPRO8 system, VWAP starts populating at 6 a.m. because that's when the prices start populating. On my platform, 4 a.m. is when prices start populating, so VWAP will be uh, adjusted or anchored, I don't want to use that word, will start populating at 4 a.m. So sometimes what I notice, especially on more volatile stocks, the VWAP on PPRO8 will be a little bit different than the VWAP on my platform, and that's because they start populating at a different time. You need to um, apprise yourself of where your platform starts populating VWAP, okay? No, I'm not done. 
Attempting to create an average view up over many days could distort it and result in an incorrect indicator. So this is basically, uh, you know, it's, it's criticizing the anchored VWAP system. But we're not going to get too much into that. While some institutions may prefer to buy when the price of a security is below VWAP or sell when it's above it, VWAP is not the only factor to consider. In strong uptrends, the price may continue to move higher for many days without dropping below the VWAP at all or only occasionally. And essentially what there is going to happen in those situations is you're going to miss out on the trade. Okay, because if you're waiting for VWAP to act as the level of support and you're, you have your resting order in and around there, it may not trigger. And that's part of the whole game here. I mean, if that was your system to get dip trades off VWAP, you're going to have to accept the fact that you may miss out on that trade. Okay. Um, VWAP is based on historical values and does not inherently have predictive qualities or calculations. VWAP is anchored to the opening price range of the day. Therefore, the indicator increases its leg as the day goes on. That's really important because we talk about these indicators being lagging indicators. They're showing us historical price action, uh, not you know predictions of future prices. Now, the problem with that is it seems to be more accurate earlier in the day and it lag, it starts becoming less accurate as the day goes on as we get more price prints, obviously. Last little bit here before we uh, throw back to Adara. This can be seen on a one minute period VWAP calculation after 330 minutes, which is typically the length of a re regular trading session, will often resemble a 390 minute moving average at the end of the trading day. So that's some food for thought there. Let's go to some questions, Adara. Yeah, I mean, I think for one, not even just like a question necessarily, but just something that I kind of, I think is interesting with VWAP too, is it's, it's best used in tandem with other, other indicators, 100%. like all indicators, right? Like if you can find confirmation, for example, you're seeing like a pattern or you're seeing something else in addition to the break of VWAP or the play around VWAP, then I think that's more interesting. And also not every stock will be interacting with VWAP at every time, right? Oh. So for example, I will use this Eli Lilly. Earlier today, we had Eli Lilly kind of in a war around VWAP. I shorted below VWAP, not necessarily because we were at VWAP, but just because um, we kind of did have these lower lows. And also VWAP was actually kind of an area we were fighting to keep earlier today, right? Like we had this war of VWAP that we lost. We lost the war of VWAP again here, right? So it looked like a good example of a time to get in. Now, Eli Lilly and VWAP are not besties. They're not looking at each other, right? So different times in the day, you could have different um, levels of, of interaction with VWAP, right? So it's not, it's not a one size fits all approach. It's definitely not something that every stock will interact with at every time. But it's like we were saying yesterday as well, right? Uh, with regards to indicators, it's always kind of nice to be aware of them uh, and aware of what they're doing. And if we're above or below them, um, even if we're not necessarily going to be interacting with them every day, right? So um, if you, if, like, for example, again, with Eli Lilly, we're currently above VWAP. So that means, you know, we, we're trading higher on the day on average than we were earlier, right? So it's still something to keep in mind. Um, with regards to like where we are price action wise on the day. Uh, but yeah, but that being said, like right now in terms of if I were to use Eli Lilly as like a point of out, for example, for my trade, it wouldn't really make sense because we're so far beyond uh, VWAP being a level that we interacted with, right? So it's kind of nice to reflect and see how we're, we're interacting with certain indicators at certain times um, because it, it will very much vary, but certain indicators are still worth obviously keeping an eye on throughout the day. So that is, um, that is Eli Lilly and um, VWAP. That is my quick little um, mention there. Another one with regards to um, like, you know, certain stocks uh, respecting levels at different times is also, um, yeah, Tesla earlier too. It was interesting because we, that was part of what kind of encouraged me to short this one earlier. We had lower lows, yes, uh, but we, and lower highs, but we also like kind of fell off of VWAP. Like VWAP was very much an area of play earlier with Tesla. We kind of lost that momentum there and it fell to the downside. If anyone has any questions too with regards to, um, you know, to, to VWAP or anything, the things we're mentioning, I would love to go over those here, there. Um, oh, uh, Elon saying what you said about VWAP on institution investors applies to Zscaler. Yeah, I know uh, Sharif was actually looking at Zscaler earlier with regards to that. So let's pull up Zscaler. Let's look at the one day on this. Yeah, that's an interesting one. Yeah, v, uh, VWAP and, and Zscaler definitely 
of note. I know, yeah, I know Strafe was mentioning earlier VWAP with regards to Z Scaler, but yeah, Z Scaler had a really nice bounce off here too. We were kind of jumping around that VWAP point after, because we had earnings after market on Monday. We went down, then we kind of shot to the upside um, yesterday and Zscaler continuing to get a nice pop there. But yeah, interesting. Also, Zscaler's daily looks really beautiful, by the way. Yeah. Not even the point. But yeah, Zscaler and VWAP, an interesting one um, with regards to, uh, yeah, VWAP. All right, Almog. From which market cap, from which market cap you know VWAP will be respected? Uh, no, 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 no. That's not what I'm trying to say at all. I hope I, that's not the message I got across. You have to observe the instrument that you are trading and look to see if VWAP is being respected by that instrument. If it's crypto, great. If it's a small cap gapper, fantastic. If it's a large cap, whatever. You have to make the observation and then judge for yourself whether this indicator is relevant on this particular day, at this particular time, with this particular instrument. It's not always gonna be the case that it is. And that's part of the subjectivity of day trading and technical analysis. And that's just part of the game. There's really no way around that. All right, moving down to some of these other questions here. Elon, hi Sharif, what you just said oh, about- Oh, that was the Zscaler one. Oh, you got yeah, that? I kind of went okay. over that briefly. No yeah. problem. Uh, Eddie R, is so Sean still short Tesla? Uh, he's gone, so I can't ask him. Um, I will as soon as he gets back, uh, Eddie. Uh, moving down. Uh, I think that that is it, right? Yeah, no other tags there. Clo asking, how does VWAP work here? Clo, 2008. Yeah, so it. it's kind of, um, yeah, it's like the average, it's the cumulative, I'm going to read the exact definition here to yeah, make go sure for that it. I get yeah, this yeah, correct yeah. here. But yeah, so basically it's roles to kind of give a smoothed out indication of the securities average price that you can actually chart. And so you can actually see, because it's one thing to know the average price, but it's I find it's really helpful um, for me trading to actually see when the price intersects or diverges from the actual VWAP line, right? So it's, it's kind of a nice visual way to see the, um, the average price there. Um, so it is basically the measurement that shows the average price of a security adjusted for volume. It's calculated during a trading session by taking the total dollar value of trading in the security and dividing it by the volume of the trades. So that is how VWAP works. Um, and yeah, it's kind of a good gauge. To, if a security is above or below VWAP, it can be, kind of show you how it's, it's sort of been trading throughout the day. Absolutely. Bang on there. Um, on on his mind clearing walk. I don't know if he's on a walk or he's in the washroom or bathroom as Americans like to say. Or Is that more of an American or, thing? They bathroom? When I say washroom to Americans, they look at me with this really? like, uh, are you speaking English? Like, huh. Yeah, yeah, especially in California at least. And I have to repeat myself right away because like I'll know I'll messed up. Oh, and you'll be like, I'll be like, oh, the toilet or the bathroom or the rest of the vibe I get from right? Cali yeah. is that it's very much like that is the way of slang, that way of speaking. And if you do not speak that way, like what are you saying? That's kind yeah. of funny. I've not been to Cali though. But you know, I noticed like Cali doesn't have like a distinct, distinct accent. They have a, you know, a little surf. There's like some of the vocal fry. Yeah, I was going to yeah. say certain areas of Cali bit. have the vocal fry. Yeah, my sister lives down there. That's why I'm talking about this, guys. Um, she lives in Orange County. Ooh, in California, nice we speak English. Says, with all to love. Yeah, I, I, like I that. guess that. Also, Bears versus Bulls says mm. restroom if in public. I did not know that. Okay. Shout out to fair, that. Fair, fair, fair. Fun facts. Yep. The boring man. Restroom is the funny one. Okay, okay. Um, Patrick, they look like deer... In a headlight when I ask washroom in Texas. Yeah, they, they don't know what the hell you're talking about when you say washroom down there. But uh, yeah, native, native Gamer says, LOL washroom. Who says that? Canadians. That's who we say washroom up here all the time. Uh, it's just the way it is, man. A potato, potato. Regional slang, dialect, whatever word you want to use. Right, yeah. exactly. Um, the loo. Yes, that's very much England. Very British. Or yeah, yeah. Well... That was, was awesome. Oh, Canada says Bears versus Bulls. <laughs> okay. Um, any, uh, anything to add with respect to VWAP or any other questions? Guys, put them in the chat. Lisi24, I'm from San Francisco. Restroom is what I use. Fair. Gotcha. I respect that. I mean, everybody has their own thing. Daryl Finch, don't trust anyone in Texas that says, bless your heart. Why not? Is that like a thing down there that I'm not aware of? Um, I thought, you know, 
I thought that was uh, sweet. I, I always find like Southern hospitality to be real. Have you ever been to the Bible Belt? I've never been there? to, um, no? I've been to like only a couple places in America, like um, Alaska, Arizona, and Florida. That's it. Um, so I, I mean, Florida, I guess is vaguely really? Southern, but um, yeah, not familiar really with the Bible Ram Belt. Ram says it's supposed to be a little sarcastic there. Or bless your heart. It's like, uh, that was yeah. sometimes the vibe I got. Uh huh. Like, I know Florida, there was a lot of, um, I don't want to use the word rude, but there is a lot of um, intensity um, oh. in Florida, at least. But also, to be fair, I spent like a lot of the time there in like, um, you know, uh, Orlando. Okay. So, I, you know, like kind of around like the malls and the Disney area. So it could have just been, the, apparently, it's pity. Bless your heart is pity. That's what people are saying. If uh, right yeah, now, that's what you. kind of, I think that's what Ray Ram was trying to Believe it, says Sharif, say Fibonacci. Fibonacci, am I saying it wrong? Fibonacci, am I? I Fibonacci, know. I thought that was Fibonacci. I'm pretty sure it yeah. is. Um, all right, believe it. Oh, going on here, all right, Eddie R. You can do a travel show, both traveling through the USA. That would be great. Um, I wouldn't mind that. Daryl Finch, yes, it's a bad <laughs> thing, so don't trust the person, anyone that tells you that. Noted, my friend, very well noted. Bless your heart, is them talking about you, says Trenches. Sure. Oh, so they're just like saying, oh, bless your heart to the other person, but they're like talking okay. about you, okay. Dylan Pearson, Florida doesn't count as south in the U.S. Is it northern Florida, though, like the Pensacola area considered part of the Bible Belt, though? That was my understanding. And then like the peninsula part, like the Miami uh, and like, well, not even just Miami, like Orlando, Tampa, St. Petersburg, Clearwater, that's like considered a different type of Florida. My understanding was the whole northern area, Jacksonville, Jacksonville, Pensacola, like the actual handle itself. I could be wrong. Yeah, I was not aware. Yeah. All right, blah, Florida is definitely the south, says Monty G, bruh. All right, man. Um, <laughs> I don't know, isn't it the south now? Uh, Neil Neil doesn't want to opine. Uh, opine. He likes Florida. He's in Florida all the time. He goes to Dunedin. Florida's nice. Or the I mean, like, I like Blue the Jays. weather. You but... know the Blue Jays have their uh, their spring training camp in like the Clearwater, St. Petersburg area. Dunedin know that. is in and around there, and Neil is there like literally every year. So huh. he should know plenty about Florida. Was not aware about that. <laughs> yeah. I... He, his oh. brother went to school in Fort Lauderdale. That's cool. The Neil. That's very nice. There you go. Yeah, off the grid says Florida is divided by north and south. That's what my understanding was. Yeah, you seem to have like a good understanding of the north and south Florida because I did not. I, I just, just went to, yeah, I, I was told. Oh, it's not really like anything. John, as a, a resident Italian, you'll need to pronounce it fi, fi bo na che. Okay, sorry. I don't want to offend any of uh, the native Italian speakers. The Katina man hasn't criticized the way that I say it. He's like the resident Italian speaker around here. We also got uh, my man Patrick back there. Shout out to Patty. Uh, also another Italian uh, friend of mine down here, baby. All right, let's keep talking. Let's keep looking here about more relevant stuff. Guys, put some stuff in the chat. Questions. Enough yeah, so we've got Florida a little bit stuff. off. off yeah, there, guys. enough of this Florida stuff. Sorry. Let's get back into focus here. Let's talk about some fibs. Let's talk about not fibs as in lies. Oh, um, Shinobi, uh, is Tesla a candidate for a VWAP test? Uh, we oh, can look. great That's question. View, we were talking about VWAP earlier, so I think this is a fair question. And I would like to, to take a look. Um, <laughs> I, have to, I have to comment about this before you do. Lolo says, I break my spaghetti in half for all the Italians out there. He's looking to cause some problems. You can tell because <laughs> Italians don't like that. Yes. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, so I'm looking at, um, honestly, I, I don't really see Tesla as a VWAP test right now. I saw it earlier when we were kind of Tesla-ing this um, 249 area. Uh, but then we kind of failed that. Um, if we break below 246, which is the area at which I exited my short, um, and that's not to be like, oh, that's it's a, an area because I exited my short there. No, I exited my short there because it was an area, um, right? Because we noticed some resistance there. That 246 has been a pretty sticking, pretty well a sticking point here. So if Tesla can hold 246, we could try again. But honestly, we have not been anywhere resembling VWAP in a while. So to answer your question, Shinobi, I would say if we're around 249, if we break 249 decisively, you could maybe consider that um, a VWAP test. Right now, I do not think Tesla is best besties um, 
with the <laughs> like I said earlier though, Tesla very much in the pre-market and then even a bit um, after we opened, Tesla was dancing around VWAP after we swooped to the downside at 1030. I would not say Tesla and VWAP are besties um, because like we were saying earlier too, um, not all indicators are valid at all points that the stock is trading, right? So um, right now, I would not say that, that VWAP is necessarily an indicator you would maybe want to use for making decisions for entering and exiting Tesla. But that does not mean that it can't be a point later. Like I said, once it breaks 249, then I would start talking about Tesla and VWAP. Sounds there good. There you are. Um, Eddie, uh, I forgot what question you wanted me to ask the Katina man. He's now returned to his desk. Tag me with, uh, with the question. Or tag the Katina man. He's now back uh, at the desk there. Fry Rye, do you prefer the 50% or the 61 for Finibachi to, as a buy trigger? I don't have a preference either way. What I want to see is respect for that level. Now, you're going to have to basically wait to allow the price action to develop at that 60 uh, what was it, 61 or that 50% level. And like Neil says, you get it on the back end. So you wait for support or resistance if you're short uh, to develop at that FIB level. And then you wait for the eventual curl back up or curl back down in the case of a short. And then you get in on the back end. And I think it's one of the best kind of descriptions uh, to explain that, allow the price action to develop and then pull the trigger. Again, I've said this before, the floor manager, uh, the former floor manager on here used to say this all the time, participate, don't anticipate. If you're gonna anticipate though, have a tight stop, not, I don't wanna say tight stop, but have a stop that makes sense. That way, if you're wrong on the first entry, you, you, it's a paper cut. You can get back in, you haven't blown up your account, you haven't taken a big L, you're not shut down like uh, on the trading floor here, right? Um, that's what I would say to that, okay? I don't have a preference either way. I wanna see what that particular instrument is respecting on that particular day, uh, and that's just the way I see that. Uh, Juan Alejandro Castillo Pau. I put ketchup in my pasta. Ooh, that is not gonna please uh, yeah, many has, of Yeah, Ernie has made her. The Katina man her. just hit the fill. He's hitting the fill. He doesn't appreciate that kind of stuff around here, man. No, he's kidding, of course. Uh, uh, Ram Ram says, that's a crime. <laughs> She's very displeased with that. So the Katina man and Ram Ram both. Uh, I like that she tagged him too, so he knows that oh she yeah. thinks it's a crime. Oh yeah. Um, looking here. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay. All right, guys. Peter King, Sharif, do you guys get paid on profit you made on day trading? Yes, it's a certain percentage. You I get trade percentage. Sam, so I am just paper trading. Adara to is clarify. learning. Yeah. I am learning and hopefully growing. It's a percentage over here. You, you don't take the whole pie, right? We're not going to get into the deets, but that's, uh, that's kind of how it works in and around here. All right, guys. You, as you can see, I've been long GME for a little bit now. The point was, uh, come to the chart, uh, the point was that we made a higher low. So I waited, like Neil says, to get in on the back end, and I waited until it clearly made that higher low, and then it curled back up. I punched into this one. We're obviously having issues with 17, like we've been having uh, essentially since around uh, 12 o'clock, 12.15, when we first touched that 17 level. We did get a decisive break of 17, but then we chwadumped back down. We got to about 17 and a third, but it's been a series of higher lows, hence why this trade interested me. I have a couple of profit takers here, Adara, at 1705 and 17. 10, but we need to get that decisive break of 17. It looks like every time we're coming in and around there, we're having obvious issues. Well, I like it too, because we keep talking about like technical levels and you had like a whole thing for that, for that stock where you were like, if it doesn't have a lower high, then I'm interested, right? Or, uh, sorry, lower low. Lower if the low. lows do not get lower, lower low. than you're yeah. interested. So I think that's like a good point to kind of, um, I think, make there. Also, people making some jokes about the paper money. Yeah, it's all metaphorical over here. But yeah, no, that, that GME trade is... Um, yeah, well, we'll see what it ends up doing, but uh, you know, uh, we're obviously having issues at 17. But you know, we're, we got about 13 minutes left on the show, so whether or not you know this breaks that level and we get a, we already got a couple of beak wetters here, but nothing really to write home about. Looking for that decisive break of 17, though. Nice. Um, any other questions, guys, about fibs or view up? There we go. The 17 breaks. Now let's see if 17.05 fills. We're just a smidge below 17.05. I saw it come in on the ass. It's got a cross. The ask, and there it is. So we get that fill as well. Now we're looking for that 17.10. Do we finally get a 17 hold? 
I mean, we, we haven't gotten a 17 hole all day. It was a V-shaped retracement off that 17 and a third. This is the fourth attempt at 17 on GME, 26 and two thirds percent. Here comes, and there it is. We paper handed the first trade when we hit the flatten button, baby. Uh, I will be not touching the flatten button unless it tanks here. Um, hopefully again, hopefully we'll get a nice No flatten runoff. button. Yeah, I gotta move the flatten button, guys. I'm gonna move it to the F9 to F12 keys. because It's just funny too, because it's, it's like happened and it always happens when it's like the really good trades too. Idiot. Which is I'm why it's like. I'm a bad trader. What can I say? It's not, it's not uh, your fault. It's the buttons. No, it's, the I buttons. put the buttons there. Yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> I'm, try, I'm trying to give you one. <laughs> I, know, I know you're trying I'm to help try. me out here, but I'm trying. when you're wrong, you're wrong, right? Yeah, um, Juan, say what you will. Pasta with ketchup and hot dog sausages hit different. That reminds me of like Sheldon Cooper, man. Doesn't he love uh, spaghetti and, uh, and hot dogs? That's like his favorite meal. Anybody who n watches The Big Bang Theory knows that is Sheldon Cooper's favorite meal. Uh, because his mom made it when he was young. Yeah, yeah, that's the... I had a roommate that almost exclusively made that. And oh, yeah? did not enjoy the smell of it. <laughs> Ram Ram doesn't like it. Yeah. She's hitting the fail button up umpteen amount of times. Okay, <laughs> Ram Ram, calm down there, bro. <laughs> she wants you to know it's really a fail. Yeah, she... She, she feels, not, but she feels like pleased. that's how many times she's failed. Right? Yeah, Ram Ram's hitting fail all over. It. Well, you know, she's backing you like up here. Yeah, well, I know. I know. <laughs> Shaw's backing up Ram Ram there. There's okay, also, um, there's Fed Master, so I'm just getting some updates from Benzinga. Uh, go for it. Um, Fed Master says steps should be taken to, and sorry, I'm just reading the headline, yep. should be taken to increase resilience of non-bank non -bank financial firms. Ma more work needed on credible bank resolution mechanism. More regulation should focus on market value of bank balance sheets. Another update, she said that policy, mo monetary policy must be nimble. Great word. Okay. In current circumstances, mon monetary policy will be positioned to be flexible and the economy has been resilient in face of restrictive monetary policy, which I agree with. And she sees clear progress in lowering still high inflation. So she thinks we had- um, Good. Yeah, we had Barkin being a little more hawkish earlier right? today. But yeah, um, Fed's Mester has basically said that she is seeing some progress, although acknowledging that inflation is still high. We've had a lot of mixed sentiments, yeah. I would say, with the Fed speakers in the last few days. Um, also, yeah, so she's saying that she thinks monetary policy is not a good place. So that, uh, she says it will take time to get inflation to 2%, but Central Bank will do it. Monetary policy is tightened financial conditions. Yeah, so not, not a bad look, I, I think necessarily, you know, some things have been said. Um, but yeah, and I think... <laughs> some things have been said. I like that, like some beef went down or something yeah, like some that. Yeah, things have been said. Things were said in the heat of the moment. Oh yeah, you're right. I did yeah. word it that way. Yeah, also, she has great hair, though. She's on your yeah. little side thing there. Yeah, I was going to load her up. Uh, I, I was going to give her a nickname, but, you know, maybe maybe it's inappropriate. Uh, this is Loretta Mester, guys. Fantastic uh, president of the bank, Central Bank of Cleveland. She's so it's not Mary mestering Daly. up the market right now. Oh, there you go. That's there you great. go. All right, let's get to some other questions here. Thank you, Elon, for the kind words. Uh, GME's high was 1736. Yeah, that's what I was saying, 17 and a third. So in and around that area, says a boring man. Uh, Sharif, Zion, Lala, what's up, man? Um, <laughs> you're hilarious, Zion, you kill me, bro. Sally, uh, need a keyboard smash. No, that is only reserved for the Katina man. He's the only one that can smash his keyboard around here. What day was that? Do we have a day for the keyboard smash? Sorry, he, correction. He never smashed the keyboard. Redacted. He dropped the Redacted. keyboard. We need to know what day that was. It was not about trading. I wasn't. It was about something else. The keyboard was not. I know, I know. He, uh, Sean likes a very specific type of keyboard. It's hard to show the type of keyboard that he has over there. Eh? It's a key. It's that one. Oh. Okay, so show them. It's a good keyboard. Yeah, it's, just, it's, it's like uh, the old school keyboard. Taller, it's just, it's... It's like sturdy. Yeah. yeah. No, I know, I know what he... Be. I actually never thought about it, but I do know what you mean. And he was provided a keyboard that wasn't, you know, punching in right. So he, he let the keyboard know who was boss. There, there we go. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I like that. Ponzi Fonzi, can you uh, look at a shout out for the Ponzi? Yo, Ponzi, man. There's no Lambo trade for you today. It's only Honda Civic trades today, baby, but there's nothing wrong with that either. Shout out to all my Civic that drivers really out there. That was really good. Um, <laughs> Corolla trades. Civic there you Corolla, go. like that kind of. Um, Eddie R, not a beauty cougar, certainly Fed's Mester. Well, you know, she, she, she's a good woman. Uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Ram Ram, don't smash the keyboard. Smash the like button. Yeah. 
Here we go. I enjoyed that. If you're enjoying this video, oh. please take a second and hit the Oh, he's not, <laughs> he's not here. He That's not be, even fair. He's not, very, he can't defend not himself. He'd be very upset right now. <laughs> All right. Um, need somebody to throw a shoe. I miss a rune, says Maxi. <laughs> yeah, I remember when uh, uh, the Pratstradamus was hit with the shoe there. I was watching, actually, when it Pratt happened. Pratstradamus? Uh, yeah, oh, well, he's like a that. former uh, uh, trader on you. No, I just like the nickname. The boring man. He drops the mic. He drops his keyboard. What's next? Right. He says, that's, that's right, right, baby. That's like right, threat. baby. Stay tuned. <laughs> Oh, he's got it. Stay tuned go. for what's next. <laughs> Shout out to everybody out there. Hope you're having a great day. Uh, we're just chilling out. You know, we've got our little, there you go. We've got our little coffee going on right now. We're, we're ready to rock and roll. We're working on a few things. You know what I mean? We're checking out some pivot points. I agree we're, with the bear. We're getting all educated up right now. You know, we're short Tesla right now. We're $2 in the money. Yo, what's up, Sharif, my what's guy? What's up, man? Uh, yeah. There's that money coming down. Sean, save some for some of us, man. No, 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 no. Today, <laughs> today, everyone can have lots of money, except for me, uh, actually. I'm just, I'm, you know, what, what we do basically during lunch is try to, try to put on some trades, not too many shares. I listen to hear all about Fibonacci's and things like that. Um, and then also, you know, adding some stuff to my charts. Like I, I'm, I'm literally looking right now at uh, pivot points. You know, I was, I was looking at uh, different nice. ways of getting in and getting out of trades and trying to add them to the uh, portfolio. You know, you can't, the minute you stop learning, you know, you might as well uh, give up the trade. You know Pivot what I'm saying? Pivot points are so, fantastic, too, by the way. Great support and resistance levels. Five more minutes, and then you can, uh, you can <laughs> hear more of me. Let's, let's go back to the real talent. Thanks for that, Sean, and thanks for chiming like in the there. Update, yeah. Shout out to the Katina man, baby. Uh, can you just update us on your positions real quick? I know that you're going to be on in five minutes. It's, it's, uh, 249, Short Tesla, 249, oh, Palantir. Two and a quarter on Palantir. Stop. Game stonk, he's short, uh, he's long, 16, 15. The monkey has diamond hands. The, the uh, what's it called there? They're called the apes there, but that's oh, yeah, the for AMC, AMC apes. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Not, I All right, guys. Um, <laughs> any other questions in the chat? We have about five minutes left. What's going on there? Ooh. It was the smoke one. Ah, okay. Any other questions about some of the topics that we had today? We discussed VWAP at length. We discussed Fibonacci's at length. Um, next week, wow. next week, we'll be coming at you with oscillators. I'm excited. Mm. I'm excited for all the weeks, honestly. I feel like I love just put, like kind of learning everything, getting it all together. Yeah. Um, and I hope people are getting something out of it. Yeah. yeah. Oscillators, guys, like we talked about yesterday on the show, moving averages and moving average-based indicators are fantastic for trending markets. However, they are very bad for consolidative markets. That's step in, that's where you use oscillators. Oscillators are the indicator of choice during consolidative markets. They produce less false signals, or so I'm told. So we'll talk a lot about that next week. I'm talking about money flow index. I'm talking about relative strength. Lots of different oscillators that we can talk about and that will be on the uh, docket for next week, Adara. Um, go ahead. Yeah, no, I'm, yeah, I'm, just, yeah, I'm excited for, for yeah. all the new lessons and kind of trying to, to figure things out. And I, yeah, I appreciate everybody asking questions. Um, yeah, exciting times. Okay. Uh, Fryride, do you use candlestick theory to help with reading the Fibonacci retest or the VWAP retest, or do you always wait for the curve back up? Look, I like candlestick patterns. Um, I do. Um, I don't know how much I trust them on an intraday basis. Again, I like them a little bit more on a daily, like the engulfing bullish, engulfing bearish. There's so many different ones that we can talk about. We're going to get to candlestick patterns, um, you know, in a later week. I, you know, if there is one that obviously stands out at me, I don't mind using it. I don't have any problems using multiple indicators to confirm a setup. The more, the merrier. Uh, but do I look for that combination exclusively? No. The answer to your question there is no. But I will look for other confirmatory indicators, whether that is, you know, <laughs> Sean likes it. I didn't, confirmatory, it's basic. What I, what I am looking for are other signals to show me this is the right setup, this level is important. For example, 
whether it's price action, uh, previous support and resistance, a closing print, uh, something on the daily or the hourly that I saw, uh, multiple level, multiple touches at that level. Uh, you know, there's not really one hard and fast rule that I can say, but you're looking for multiple indicators pointing to whatever level you're looking at to kind of help confirm that this level is important or this level is not important. I hope that helps. Um, GME volume, yeah, it's still doing the dance with no pants here at 17. It really, I haven't gotten a beak wetter at that 17.15 or that 17.20. We did get four out so far through the break of 17.10, but we're gonna probably have to pack our patience here. About a couple of minutes left on the, uh, on the show, and then we're gonna send you to Brendo at the big desk and the big kahunas. They'll be taking you through power hour. Make sure to hang out and find out how we do on the afternoon session. Big stuff today, guys. We had multiple Fed speakers. We had GM coming in hot. We had earnings from Foot Locker, which we didn't look at, by the way. Yeah, Foot Locker wasn't doing that much. I was looking at it yeah. earlier, and it's just kind of like, me. Yeah. Well, yeah. I was doing a lot pre-market, but like it kind of died a little bit. Yeah, well, that's when the news came out. I think the report in the morning, right? It wasn't in, it wasn't I in the I believe it was in now. the morning, yeah. Yeah. So interesting stuff, guys. Fantastic stuff today. We also had... Um, Sorry, give me one second here to just pull up some of the notes that I made. There's also the Fed Beige book coming up at 2, which is another yes. thing to keep an eye on yes. for everybody. Absolutely. Um, Fed Beige book right now, that's what uh, Eddie is saying. Fry Rye, so are Fib and VWAP no support or resistance levels, or are they different indicators? Fib. Okay, so what I want you to understand is that, you know, you... They're, they're both very valid indicators. However, they may or may not be respected by that particular instrument at, at that, on that particular day at that particular time. You have to make the assessment by watching how it trades at that level. If it's not respecting it, don't use it, okay? But if you are watching it and there's obvious respect and there's confluence between two indicators, that should be an alert to you that this is something important that I need to be aware of. And so I'm not trying to say don't pair those two together. I'm just saying I personally don't pair them together. And when I do pair different indicators together, I'm not exactly waiting for that setup. I'm looking, oh, how is it doing on this particular day? How is it trading um, or how is it respecting VWAP today? How is it respecting the 50% uh, retracement on the FIB? I don't use FIBs, by the way, intraday. I use them on the daily. So that's the kind of the, the idea that want, I want you to have there, guys. Um, all right. It is 2 o'clock. Look at that. Yeah, um, I really hope people learn some stuff today about um, Fibonacci and VWAP, and we're excited to come back again tomorrow with more lessons about uh, indicators. For now, though, uh, we will see you tomorrow, same bad time, same bad channel. For now, uh, Brendan's at the big desk. Hey, guys, yeah, welcome back in. 2 o'clock on a busy afternoon here as we get, uh, I mean, we're back to positive territory, but a bit of a quiet session right now.